Welcome in, everyone. Hello, everybody, again. <laughs> <laughs> so we just recorded about an hour of this episode and realized that our mics, our audio recorder, wasn't actually going. Um, so we're going to take this from the top. Again, this is Everything Sucks, Let's Fix It, by the way. My name is Ben Mayer. My name is Anthony Buono. Today is January 11th, 2024, still. Um <laughs> I made some comment about how we have a lot to talk about, as I always do. We're starting with Iowa. Iowa primary, four days away. We have a Republican election coming up. Yes, and listen, Iowa is like a holiday to me. I love it. I look forward to it. Every presidential election, it is my bread and butter. But this year, it is boring as hell because the person who is leading is up by like 25 points. But obviously being Donald Trump in that case, uh, <laughs> yes. if you don't know him, he's kind of a national figure, but I understand if it kind of went under the radar yeah. for you. If you've been living under a rock for the last 10 years, you might not know what we're talking yeah. about. Um, so I do want to give a little bit of background history about Iowa because it is kind of interesting. Iowa has been the first in the nation to vote for president in the primary since 1960 when Democrat activists fought to make their voice more prominent in choosing who gets to be the nominee for the party's president. Uh, and that's really, really interesting. It kind of shows how like committed the people of Iowa are to practicing this form of localized democracy. Mm -hmm. Even the caucus process is super interesting. Um, on my bucket list, and this might be the, I might be the only person in the world that has this on their bucket list, but I want to go to an Iowa caucus one day before I die. You probably are the only person in the world. <laughs> I really do, though. I, I one, one year, I'm going to make it out there, yeah. and I want to report on it and see it real time because it's so interesting. Um, people will go into a gymnasium of a school, of a cafeteria, of um, even like, you know, like a church building or something. Maybe not a church building, but you know what I'm saying. A large venue hall. And they will go to the physical corners of the room to show their support for each candidate. And it's so interesting. Yeah. And, then, and then they go up and they debate and they talk. And then some people change sides to the other side of the room. And it's this very fluid, very participatory practice of democracy that I absolutely love. Yeah. That's so, wonderful. It, it makes it seem like people are so much more open than if you're online, it ever seems people are, right? Exactly. When you're online, everyone seems extremely stubborn, stuck in their views. It seems like it's hearkening back to hopefully to, I, you would think, a better political time. Yeah. Where people actually like cared to talk to, about politics with all their neighbors yes. right? and actually debate the issues. And that's cute. I like that. Yeah. They I would, think it's really important. They would actually listen to what other people had to say. What a shocker. And give consideration to their ideas. That's yeah. insane. Not me. <laughs> no, I'm kidding. So, but Iowa has a history of being very, very important in, uh, throwing candidates onto the national stage. Um, this happened with Obama in 2008. In 2004, Obama was a nobody until he gave the keynote speech at the Democratic National Convention to bring uh, John Kerry as the Democratic nominee. After that, he gave this wonderful speech about pretty much nothing, but as some of the best oratory skills I've ever seen mm -hmm. portrayed. Um, and then he runs against Hillary Clinton for president in 2007, 2008. So... When we get into Iowa, uh, before before Iowa, right, Obama is 20 points behind Hillary Clinton in the polling averages. A massive, massive deficit. Mm -hmm. But Obama wins in Iowa, and just like that, overnight, he starts tying her nationally. Mm -hmm. And that just goes to show how much the Iowa effect can have on a candidacy. It throws you on the, on the national stage. You get to give that primetime speech at at, you know, 9 p.m. where everybody's tuned in. You really get to make your voice heard and make a name for yourself in a way that if you don't win Iowa and you're a nobody, it's very hard for people to care about you. Yeah. Now, it kind of has a little bit different of a reputation in Republican politics. In 2016, Ted Cruz won Iowa. Uh, he did not become president. Thank God. Then we had Rick Santorum. He won Iowa in 2012. Rick Santorum was a Pennsylvania senator and Mitt Romney won the nomination that year. So Iowa isn't as much of a bellwether as it is in the Republican Party as it is for Democratic 
politics. Mm. And that kind of takes us to where we are now in this Iowa race. So at the front, we have Donald Trump at 52%. Behind him, we have Ron DeSantis at 17%, Nikki Haley tied at 17%, Ramaswamy 6 Christy 3 Now, what's notable about Chris Christie is, is that he did drop out, but we will talk about that in a second. What I want to focus on is Ron DeSantis and Nikki Haley tied for second, even after DeSantis made his entire game of winning Iowa. Mm-hmm. God, that is so sad. Yeah. He spent all of his money trying to win Iowa. And not only is he 30 points behind Donald Trump, he's also tied for second against Nikki Haley. And Nikki Haley has not made Iowa her top priority. Her top priority has been New Hampshire. Yeah. And it shows. Yeah. So I think we should talk for a second about why why does this why did it play out this way? Yeah. Right. So I think politically you have Ron DeSantis who kind of we agree sits to the right of Trump on policy. Yeah, I issues, agree. Right. For sure. Um, specifically as a as a social conservative. So he has to kind of he's trying to eat from Trump on that side and also to make the case that he's more viable politically because he didn't have to go through all of the January sixth stuff. He didn't try to usurp the seat of president illegally, right? Uh but Meanwhile, there's this entire really solid Republican base that doesn't really have a problem that Trump did those things, that are super attached to the cult of personality that is Trump. Meanwhile, Nikki Haley sits to the left of Trump on policy. She seems more pragmatic. She comes off as more pragmatic than Trump and as DeSantis would be themselves. Mm -hmm. So she, I think, has – she has a bigger – kind of slice of the pie to try to take from as far as the Republican voter base. She has more of an avenue to a win or at least to a greater voting share. I totally agree. And there are actually very substantial policy differences between Nikki Haley and Donald Trump. Donald Trump says immigrants are poisoning the blood of our country. Nikki Haley says we need to let more immigrants in. They just need to come legally. Mm -hmm. Donald Trump says we need to leave NATO and we got to stop sending support for Ukraine. Nikki Haley says we need to arm Ukraine with as much weapons as we can so that Putin does not win. Mm -hmm. There are massive substantial policy differences. There's also some where Donald Trump says he doesn't want to raise the age of retirement for Social Security. Nikki Haley does want to raise the age of retirement for Social Security up to 70. Yes. So there are actually disagreements there. But when we get to DeSantis Trump, it's actually way harder to kind of pick those out. Yeah. It becomes very difficult. It's almost like Ron DeSantis is taking Trump's dial and just turning it a bit to the right. Exactly. DeSantis is more extreme on abortion. DeSantis is more extreme on the government's role in education and restricting speech on certain things like critical race theory. Um, But for a lot of things, like as far as immigration, they're basically aligned. Right. Right. Um, As far as I don't know, economic policy. I think they're probably basically aligned. Basically aligned. Yeah. So they're, they don't feel so much different. And at the same time, DeSantis's charisma is about 10% of that of Trump's or negative 10%. Negative 10%. Dude, Ron DeSantis makes me cringe every time I look at him. Yeah, exactly. And that's part of why he's tied with Haley despite putting all of this money into Iowa. Yeah, because they're trying to, listen, who's ever given him money is trying to prop up a dead horse here. I mean, Ron DeSantis just, he does not have what it takes to be a national figure. Yeah. Uh, I, I mean, always feel bad for him every time he talks because just looking at him, he looks uncomfortable. Totally. We talked last week about all of the donors to DeSantis that pulled out their money and started donating it to Haley instead. Yeah. Dead, right, yeah. which was which I think is a great strategic move, for and a great example of this is how she's doing in New Hampshire. Yes, so she's already been very, very good in New Hampshire. Currently, Trump is at forty-two percent in New Hampshire. Haley is at thirty. Christie is at twelve, and then DeSantis is at five. Ramaswamy at five. What's notable about New Hampshire here is that Christie is at twelve percent. Well, Chris Christie just dropped out. So it's very, very important that we look into the cross tabs and see, okay, well, if Chris Christie voters can't vote for Chris Christie, who can, who would they vote for? Well, we have the answer to that question. 65% of Chris Christie voters say that if not for Chris Christie, they'll vote for Nikki Haley. And then another 8% say Hutchinson, but I, I don't count that much. 0% say they'll vote for DeSantis and 0% say they'll vote for Donald Trump. That is Absolutely awesome for Nikki Haley. Absolutely devastating for Ron DeSantis. I want to say that again. Ron DeSantis is at 5% in New Hampshire. New Hampshire is a very important state to win. Mm -hmm. It is the second state. It gets you the good primetime media. Yes, it doesn't have the or and ah, the ooh and ah of Iowa, but 
it's important. It's really important. And DeSantis being at 5% is really bad. And so Nikki Haley winning in New Hampshire, especially with this Chris Christie vote that now she's going to be accumulating, she could propel this into a really good South Carolina performance. Not so much in Nevada because their system is all kinds of messed up. But in South Carolina, she could do something pretty impressive. Yeah. I, I listen to, I think Haley really does have an avenue. I think Haley really can win this nomination. There's time. Okay. We have Iowa in four days, but Super Tuesday isn't for almost two months, right? So there's a lot of time for her to ramp up. Already, anecdotally, I hear a lot of testimonies from Republicans who are saying they're just, they're over the drama with Trump, yeah. right? They don't, and they think he's not electable. And I feel like as many people as are super solidly in his corner, there are going to be as many people who are completely caught up in the echo chamber of how bad Joe Biden is. And they're thinking about electability. And Nikki Haley so clearly comes off as the electable candidate. Dude, here. and I'm scared of Nikki Haley. As yeah. as a person who votes for the Democratic Party, I am worried about Nikki Haley as the future of the, De of the Republican Party because yeah. I think she's a very, very effective politician yes i think she has a very good way of speaking i think she's a very good way of making her arguments i don't agree with them but i do think she communicates them well and i think that honestly she is way more reasonable to, way more reasonable and that's appealing to a lot of people yes she has reason yes that's the thing even if they're bad reasons they are reasons that could be plausibly believed by mm -hmm. people exactly that's exactly right um, and even if Nikki Haley doesn't get the nomination, she is setting herself up to be a very, very prominent national figure. I can definitely see four years from now, if Donald Trump becomes the nominee and then and then they lose the presidency because of that, they're going to look back and think, wow, why didn't we give Haley a look? Why didn't we give Haley a shot? And then maybe prop her up four years from now, too. I don't yeah. think her career ends if she loses to Trump this time around. Definitely not. I mean, I think a Haley runs again in 28. I think Ramaswamy definitely runs again in 28. If Trump loses this time, the the party no longer could possibly back him. So, right? I mean, he might run. That would be hilarious. But, like, they're, they're going to look more and more every time he runs again after losing. They're going to look more incompetent for trying to prop him up. So, I mean, can you think of a Republican right now who seems more viable, right? No. No, so, I, I can't. No. But I will say presidential nominees do come out of the woodwork sometimes. True. I mean, Obama's a good example of that, right? I mean, even Haley feels like she came out of the woodwork this time. I mean, listen, when Haley announced her, uh, her, uh, her run, I was laughing my ass off. Mm. I, watched her, I watched her opening campaign speech, and I was like, no one's going to bite on this. I was wrong. Well, interestingly, did you hear the recording of the hot mic? Yeah, I did. Okay, so after Christy dropped out, there was uh, some audio that came out, and I wonder how planned this was. You think mm. so? But why? But okay, so so basically, on the hot mic, they uh, it caught Christy saying, "Haley doesn't have a shot. She's going to get smoked." Um, and he was about to say something at DeSantis, but then it got cut off. Why wouldn't? he want to prop up Haley. So he actually said this directly. He talked about this directly. He specifically, or, or indirectly actually, because Haley hasn't ruled out being Trump's vice president, he said that he would look like a fool if he endorsed somebody and then they became Trump's vice president. Well, you know who has ruled out being Trump's vice president? Who? Vivek. Oh, man. Maybe Christie's going to endorse Vivek. <laughs> oh, my God. The chat bot, G chat GPT. Yeah, that's what he called him. Oh. I, God, the, I mean, the only person that that Christie could trust would not be Trump's vice president, who's going, who's is going Hutchinson. to be running. No, is Biden. Oh, is Biden? Well, actually, I've heard reports that Christie might endorse Biden. Wow, I've heard reports, but that's. I, but if that happens, then his endorsement is useless because I don't think they're. I mean, they just won't vote, which maybe is useful. Maybe that is useful. Yeah. Um. Yeah, it's just crazy. But now I, let's get more into Trump's criminal proceedings here. <laughs> and God, this was just, this was just something else, man. Yeah. So Donald Trump, he is on trial. He is being criminally in, indicted for uh, ninety-one felonies or something. Ninety-one counts. Yep. Ninety-one counts. Um, one of them that they are fighting right now in the U.S. Appeals Court is Jack Smith's January six case. And this is specifically regarding the fake elector scandal where Donald Trump forged documents and committed this grand conspiracy to try to defraud the people of the United States and their right to vote. 
So um, the are, they are going to this appeals court and claiming that the president has immunity for all official acts that are committed during his time in office while he is president. But there are some asterisks to that. So let's go through there. Trump's lawyers claim that all official acts are protected and cannot be criminally prosecuted against by the judicial system. Um, if and only if the, the, the judicial system can only prosecute the president if he has been impeached by the House and convicted in a Senate hearing. And since he was not convicted in the Senate uh, for his second impeachment regarding January 6th, his, his attorneys are saying, Trump's immune. This story's over. It's mm -hmm. done. Guy got away with it. It's over. Um, which is just insane to think about, first of all. But the judge agrees that this is insane to think about and proposes a very, very important hypothetical. Yes. The judge in the U.S. Appeals Court uh, asks Trump's attorney directly, can the president order SEAL Team 6 to assassinate a political rival and get away with it if he is not impeached and not convicted by the Senate? And then Trump's l attorney says, uh, basically, that is correct. Yes. So... What kind of world are we living in here? Yeah. What are we going on about? Are we really going to be voting in a guy who whose attorneys are arguing in court in blatant language that he could kill a political rival with SEAL Team 6, resign from the presidency, and escape all criminal persecution for murder? Yeah. It's absolutely insane when you think about the dedication of our system to freedom of speech and expression, right? It, like to have that loophole would be, would completely corrupt it. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, I do. When I hear this, I just think, God, that is a brilliant proposed question by the judge. I know. I think, like I would, I love calling people out with like logical fallacy questions like that. Man, I would love to be in that position. Oh, dude, I, I know. God, her, she must have felt so fucking good. Yeah, that, dude. Yeah. Oh, God. So, Trump's lawyer makes two main arguments, and he cites two different things about why Trump has this immunity to criminal prosecution. He cites James Madison's Federalist Paper 47, and he cites Marbury versus Madison, pages 164 to 166. Like, the absolute fucking loser nerd I am, I read through both, and I kind of made my own little arguments around them. So in Federalist Paper 47, James Madison is talking about the separation of powers. He's going through, okay, how are powers separated in New Jersey? How are they separated in Virginia? How are they separated in New Hampshire? And he's kind of going through the state constitutions, and he's trying to figure out, okay, what's the right thing to do nationally? How should we handle that? Well, Trump's attorney makes the claim that Federalist Paper 47 says that the criminal, that James Madison was worried that the criminal process would be abused for political purposes to disable the presidency. Well, nowhere in Federalist Paper 47 does they even do, does he even mention the criminal process? Doesn't even touch it. All it talks about is, okay, how does the legislature interact with the executive branch? How does the Supreme Court interact with the legislature? That He's talking about this cyclical relationship between all the branches of government, never does he mention criminal proceedings at all. Mm. So I don't know where he's getting that from. There are some interpretations that you could make saying that because the judge has this relationship with the legislature and executive, and this is where James Madison is defining it, and criminal stuff isn't talked about there, but that's just ridiculous. Yeah. Yeah, that's just it's totally It's such raging. a leap. It's such a leap. Yeah. But it's all he's got. So then we have Marbury versus Madison, pages 164, 166. And here, um, J J Chief Justice John Marshall says that the president's actions are, in fact, reviewable by courts if they impact individual rights of the citizenry or it is the president performing the acts of the law that of the law of what the law demands. But he says, uh, Chief Justice does say that the p all political and discretionary acts taken by the president are not examinable by the courts. Well, I think this is a pretty open and shut case. If the Trump's attorney is going to say that I want to use pages 164, 166 of Marbury versus Madison to make the claim that Trump is immune, I think you cited the thing that directly disproves your case. Mm. The, Trump's actions on January 6th, on and around January 6th, were specifically attacking the individual rights of the people of the United States. And that's what Jack Smith is indicting him on. He is saying that the civil voting rights of the people of America are being defrauded by the president's actions, specifically attacking 
the individual rights of the American people. So by Chief Justice uh, Justice Marshall's own opinion here, the actions are absolutely reviewable by the courts. Mm -hmm. So I think all the Trump's attorney's uh, arguments fell flat on his face. Um, The judge pushed even harder to try to make him see that his logic was extremely uh, at fault, and he really didn't have a lot of cohesivity in his... uh, is that a word? Cohesion. Cohesion. Thank you. <laughs> Listen, we already recorded this section, okay? Cut me a fucking break. <laughs> yeah, you've been talking for a long time now, too. So, so okay. Yeah. So, that that's where we ended up here. And yeah. it's just crazy because Trump's own defense attorney in the criminal, I'm sorry, in the Senate conviction process during his second impeachment said that, okay, maybe Trump did something wrong, but let's let the criminal courts take care of that. And now that we're here letting the criminal courts take care of it. He's like, no, we had to have that decided in impeachment, so now we can't do it here. Trump's whole fucking mess is just tied in this knot of deception, lies, insurrection, just, and it's (laughs) impossible to make a straight thing out of it now. Yeah, I I mean, again, I I respect the strategy. Yes. Yeah, we we talked last week about Trump's strategy as a campaigner in Iowa, and how we were we were quite impressed by it by the reach that he's attempting to get like on the ground with people there. I this is what I mean. He is he is pulling every lever that he can grab as right he now. should, dude. Yeah, as he should. Of course, I'm just glad that we we see the judges being extremely skeptical of it. Like I I would be shocked by anything other than a blatant dismissal of this case. Yeah, like. No, absolutely not. There's no immunity here. He can absolutely be tried. Yeah, and I, I listen, I really hope that happens. I hope it happens soon. And then, you know, Donald Trump can come out and say, oh, the system's rigged and I didn't get my fair shake in court and blah, blah, blah. Bro, the stuff you said in a courtroom, you should be locked up already. <laughs> if you were any other citizen of the United States attacking judges, you would be held in contempt. Yeah. Uh, you're getting away very easy compared to the average Americans. They you want to yeah. talk? You want to talk about the miscarriage of justice and the distribution of power in the judicial system? Trump is the guy with all the power. Trump is the guy who's getting treated unevenly because he's getting treated well compared to the average American. Totally. Did you hear what happened in his civil trial today? I did so, not. So Trump has recently gotten sued for fraud for um, like for valuing his buildings wrong in New York and. They're, the sentencing is going to be like a $320 million fine that needs to be paid or God, something like so that. God, that's so funny. Um, and he he had put in a petition or something to speak for himself in the closing argument of his defense today. And the judge was going to allow it with the caveat that he couldn't attack the attorney general who had brought the case and that he couldn't personally attack the judge. And so he gets up and he does both of those things <laughs> instantly. <laughs> and he's not going to get punished for it because the the justice system workers here are actually sensitive to the political ramifications of their issues, which I don't fault them for, which I give them grace for. I'm actually thankful. I think that's a good thing. Yeah. But we do have to acknowledge that that means he's getting treated better. Right. 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 So every time Marjorie Taylor Greene comes out and says that there's a weaponization of the government and a two-tier justice system, yeah. A tear for Donald Trump and literally every other person. Yes, yes. Because you can only make that argument realistically if there's no evidence that he committed these crimes. But anyone who's looking at these arguments critically knows that there are very good arguments being made against him. Right. Very good arguments. Listen, if you read the indictments and listen, just assume everything in the indictments are true for a second. If you just read them and you assume everything's true, Trump is obviously guilty, right? Yes. So Trump... Like you, you, you really, you really got to find a lot of stuff to support your claim that these things aren't true. Obviously, that's not how it works in the judicial system, right? Jack Smith is going to have to prove his case mm-hmm. beyond a reasonable doubt. But if he's able to do so, all the things in the indictment are very damning. So, yeah, I mean, listen, unless Jack Smith is lying and he doesn't have a good case, Trump is going to jail, dude. Yeah. Well, we'll see. Yeah. So our next current event that we're going to move on to is the continuing saga of trying to prevent a government shutdown in the United States. So this has been going on since, I think, September. So it's been like five months. 
This was one of the first uh, we we've been talking about this almost since the show began. We started this thing last May. So I'm going to give a brief background hopefully. So we had Kevin McCarthy. He was the speaker of the house for a while. He was a Republican and he made a deal with President Joe Biden and congressional Democrats to pass a continuing resolution, which kept the government open for a little bit longer than the deal had initially planned to after September. It gave them 45 days. And it was like, okay, so we're basically extending our deadline to create a new budget 45 days from now. Well, they came to that agreement with conditions that kind of kept government funding at the same level that it had been at in the year before, maybe with minor cuts to non-defense spending. So this 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 passed, but it passed with Democrat support because hard right Republicans in the House Freedom Caucus hated this deal. They thought that the cuts in spending were far too little. They were outraged that Kevin McCarthy passed them, and it ended up leading to him being ousted as the speaker. First time in the nation's history. Yes. So extremely unprecedented. Matt Gates, who isn't is he technically a member of the Freedom Caucus? Do you know? I actually don't know. I imagine so. I don't know either. His politics are populist right. You get it. Um, he raised the motion to vacate. They kicked him out as speaker. And after an extremely tumultuous process of nominating multiple other speakers uh, the and voting for, trying to vote them in, failing to vote them in, the Republicans end up voting in this guy, Mike Johnson. Mike Johnson never had a leadership role in Congress before. Uh, so he was completely thrown into this, although his politics were super far right. So the people like Matt Gates, who had kicked Kevin McCarthy out, they were happy with Mike Johnson. So the thing that happened, Mike Johnson comes in, the 45-day continuing resolution that Kevin McCarthy passed starts to run out, and Mike Johnson needs to pass something else to keep the government open. And so he does pass something else. It's a 70 day, 75 day, 75 day continuing resolution that, again, pretty much keeps the government funding at standard levels. He's saying, look, we just need more time to negotiate a deal with the Democrats that is more favorable to us. And so already the far right is mad. The House Freedom Caucus is mad. They're like, we kicked out McCarthy and we're just getting kind of the same thing here. What's the deal? So they're mad, but they're like, okay, he just got here. Let's give him a chance. So those 75 days are about to run out. That continuing resolution was split into two parts. One expires January 19th and the other expires February 2nd. So once we hit January 19th, the government is going to enter a partial shutdown. Yes. Um, but then a few days ago, we get news that Mike Johnson has come to an agreement with Senate Democrats and Joe Biden to for a deal to fund the government. And we're thinking, OK, so we need to see how is this deal going to look compared to the last ones that um, the far right has hated that got Kevin McCarthy ousted. It looks exactly the same. Literally exactly the same. Exactly. The same. Small, small adjustments. Yes. So the top line figure is one point six trillion dollars for fiscal year twenty twenty four. That includes eight hundred and eighty six billion for defense and seven hundred and four billion for non defense. That number is a little bit up in the air. Yeah. Johnson is out saying seven hundred and four billion non defense. Chuck Schumer is saying nope, that's seven hundred and what'd you say? Seventy seven seventy two. But these are technicalities. They yeah. came to a deal with barely any cuts in spending from the last year. Exactly. Johnson is celebrating the $16 billion of cuts that he was able to get out. These are mainly coming from the IRS. Um, he's taking money back from the IRS that was given to the IRS in the Inflation Reduction Act. We are big proponents of giving the IRS more money so that they have the power to go after millionaire tax cheats. We did a whole episode about tax evasion and the history of defunding the IRS and its consequences. You should go check that out. But Mike Johnson also got a lot of money COVID money back and pulled that back from the executive branch. So Mike Johnson it came out of that room with Chuck Schumer. He's going on a victory lap. He's proud of himself. He's like, oh my God, I did this. Chuck Schumer's even saying like, listen, say what you want about the guy. He's not a bad dude. Yeah. Chuck Schumer's like, that's a good guy. But here's the deal. There is nothing worse in the Republican Party than to be called a good guy by New York Democrat Chuck Schumer. Yeah. So naturally... Mike Johnson comes out of this thinking he's got a deal. He did it. He's the guy who got it done. Well, 
Republicans are rebelling against him naturally. Marjorie Taylor Greene comes out right away and she says, I am a no in all capital letters to Johnson Sh- to the, to the Johnson Schumer budget deal. This $1.6 trillion budget agreement does nothing to secure the border, stop the invasion, or stop the weaponized government targeting Biden's political enemies and innocent Americans. I really want quickly want to point out that language of I am a no to the Johnson Schumer budget deal. It's very reminiscent Mm -hmm. of a remark that Matt Gates made right before Kevin McCarthy got ousted that the McCarthy Jeffries Biden government. That's exactly right. Was ruining America or something like that. Right. right? He looped McCarthy in with the Democrats entirely. And she's doing exactly the same thing with the Johnson Schumer line. She's othering him completely to try to boost herself up. And I just imagine that everyone else in the far right is about to follow suit. Oh, exactly. And listen, I want to bring attention to one thing Marjorie Taylor Greene said here. Does nothing to secure the border. Well, Are you forgetting that Joe Biden has put forth a $14 billion budget deal uh, specifically for border funding that will go to a lot of through a lot of things that we will talk about in a second. So yeah. if you really do care about the border, wouldn't you support a lot of this initiative? It's actually a bipartisan thing coming from Senate Republicans and Senate Democrats and the White House. So if you really cared about the border, you'd be on that and you'd be talking about that. But it seems like you just want to cause a ruckus and yell into the wind. Yes. But that's a whole other conversation that we'll get to in a second. Mm-hmm. In addition to Marjorie Taylor Greene, we also have Chip Roy. Chip Roy is a prominent House Freedom Caucus member, and he has not called out, uh, he has not ruled out calling for a motion to vacate. Chip Roy, th- he is, he has not ruled out ousting Mike Johnson. And so like, here we are. Like you just said, Kevin McCarthy was the first Speaker of the House to ever be ousted okay that was three months ago that was three months ago and now we're talking about running it back running it, running back. Running it back doing the same thing over and over again we're in fucking groundhog day with these people <laughs> it's insane and republicans have to recognize and a lot of them do that they only have a two-seat majority george santos got expelled kevin mccarthy retired steve scalise is out getting treated for cancer uh Guys, you don't have a choice. You have a small majority. Yeah. This means you have to compromise. It's what you have to do. And to so yesterday, Mike Johnson opened up the floor with a rules vote to begin the debate on this budget deal. And the rule vote failed. I want to put this in perspective. Since 1995, rule votes have only failed nine times. All nine of them happened within the last seven months. This is totally Insane. ungovernable. Yeah. This is a, this is a, we are a build nothing country as we've talked about. We're also becoming a do nothing country. Yeah. It's, it's really, it's scary. We talk about the Overton window, right? It's like, what is the acceptable conversation? This makes me think of a type of Overton window of like, what is valid as a mode of operation for the government? Right. And now we're getting to the point where these constant votes against rules are are part of just the modus operandi, yep. right? And that's not good. This We do not exist in a global context to be able to be this ineffective at governing. Yes. And yet our polarization is creating exactly that. Well, Joe Biden and a lot of Democrats always kind of talk about this notion of democracy versus authoritarianism and the competition that these two systems of government are in internationally. And one of the very prominent and good things about an autocracy is they're fast. Yeah. They are agile. They are quick to action. If we are this stunted that we are unable to fund our food stamp programs, mm-hmm. guys, what are we doing here? We're going to stand no chance against the international autocracy order that we're up against. Yeah, yeah. We're going to for we're, we're basically going to force more autocracy into our country. Yeah. Because the only way we can do anything is with executive action. Yeah, we are totally forfeiting our our democratic principles by not cooperating and not making compromise where necessary. Yes. We are lending ourselves to becoming autocrats, even if we're thinking we're fighting the system. Mm -hmm. Right? Totally. So this is all just a mess. And Mike Johnson has already basically gone back, and he's basically saying that the Schumer deal is basically dead. Every Republican who comes out of a backdoor meeting with Mike Johnson is saying, Schumer deal's done. Schumer deal's done. Now we're between a CR, a continuing resolution, to fund government until they can come up with another deal, or just a general shutdown. And I don't think Republicans have the appetite for another CR. 
I don't think they do. They didn't have an appetite for the first CR. The first CR only passed because Democrats got on board and more Democrats voted for the CR than Republicans did. Yeah, exactly. And and Johnson, I think, is probably too scared at this point to try to get another CR through with Democrat support. So the question becomes, right, what should Democrats be doing? Should they have pitched in some of their votes to get a more moderate but still Republican speaker? And at this point, I... I think we're we're getting too close to having a speaker of the house who says either you cut food stamps by 50% or we shut down the government. Mm-hmm. Right? There is a value to having someone who you can negotiate with, someone who can exist in that position based on some level of bipartisan support just so that you can function the government. And I think it's time that yes, the hard right Republicans deserve most of the br- most of the blame. But you can't completely absolve the Democrats either. No, listen, the Democrats do need to do something to make sure that the government continues to function. It is unfortunate, but this is the reality we're in. Republicans, as they stand with this libertarian populist streak that they're in, Mm -hmm. do not want government, period. They do not want the government involved in anyone's lives, whether that be from food stamps to anything else. They don't want it. And so when a push comes to shove and we get votes to whether or not to fund the government or not or to shut it down or not, Republicans say, okay, shut it down. That's what I was voted in here to do anyway. Yeah. And so we cannot allow Republicans of that nature to get power. But then this is the argument from the Democrat side. Democrats are saying, why would we prop up a failing party? Mm -hmm. Why would we give a party that is so beholden to radicals and reactionaries? Why would we give them any legitimacy by making them our leader? If if, if if Republicans are really concerned about governing, even if any Republicans are concerned about governing, we're down to two, right? Mm-hmm. Two-seat majority. Shouldn't they just join on to the Democrats and vote for Hakeem Jeffries or even join with Democrats and vote for a more moderate Democrat? So do you think it's more like it's an easier story to tell that the Democrat pitched in to vote for a moderate Republican? Or is it an easier story to tell for that, for those three Republican representatives that decide... I'll vote for Hakeem Jeffries. What do you mean easier story to tell? From whose perspective? What are easier we to about? pitch to my constituents. As who? The moderate Republican? Or the moderate Demo- or the the Democrats who prop up the Republicans. Mm. Right? Which which side is more viable? Because I, I think, think because the Republicans are already in the majority, it's more viable for some kind of moderate Democrat to say why they wanted to prop up the moderate Republican in order to keep government functioning. Well, I would say that, but a lot of these moderate Republicans are in districts where Joe Biden won not three years ago. So sure. in a lot of ways, these Republican congressmen are representing majority mm. Biden districts okay. that don't, as far as we know of the current election results, do not want a Donald Trump second term. Yeah. So from my perspective, it seems like it would actually be in the moderate Republicans' better interest to go and vote on the Democrat side, it might actually propped up their ability to win re-election. Okay. Right? Maybe. So it's a whole mess of a situation here. But yeah. the point is, we are dangerous of running into a situation where we are governed by people who do not operate on logic. We have yeah. always had people in our government who don't operate on logic. Mm-hmm. That is natural. That is what is supposed to happen. They aren't supposed to be the leaders of the parties. And that's where yeah. we're at now. Yeah. No one's writing them in. They're 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 controlling everything. Yeah, the crazies. So now it's either shut down or CR. And I think we'll record our next episode before January nineteenth. So we'll give another update before that deadline. Right hits. before. Yeah. So so now I do want to let's go into the the border deal, mm-hmm. the fourteen billion dollar proposal that Biden put on the table because this seems to be a big wedge issue between the parties right now. And it's like, okay, if Biden proposed a $14 billion package from Congress to be able to secure the border, and all these Republican congressmen are saying, all we want to do is secure the border, where are they differentiating? Right. Where can't, wh- why can't they find any common ground to push something forward? There are some starting points, but I'll let you, do you want to start? Or you start? can start. Okay. So it seems to be that there are six major points to this. So this was negotiated by James Lankford, uh, uh, senator from Oklahoma, Kirsten Sinema, independent senator from Arizona, and Chris Murphy, Democrat from Connecticut. Includes six major aspects. Additional border patrol agents, 
inspection technology so that they can help detect fentanyl, mm-hmm. law enforcement personnel, 1,000 additional law enforcement, asylum officers, 1,600 new asylum officers to enhance the process of asylum applications, Department of Defense reimbursements, so all the stuff that the military had to do on the U.S.-Mexico border in fiscal year, throughout fiscal year 2024, they're going to get money for to do that, and counter-drug trafficking measures. There's some other stuff in there, but that is the major six pillars of this agreement. Mm -hmm. And it is very important to know that this was negotiated by Republicans, uh, independents, and Democrats alike. Yes. All to push for something like this. Mm -hmm. Um, It specifically is going to tighten asylum laws. Uh, And this is something that Republicans should be able to get behind. It's going to allow border agents to swiftly expel migrants when a certain level in illegal crossings is reached. So it's capping the number of illegal crossings that we're allowing. Right now, the process of asylum is so messed up. If someone crosses the border illegally and then claims asylum in the United States, the United States is not currently, by law, allowed to then deport them. This would change that. If someone crosses the border illegally, claims asylum, but we've already accepted 1 million asylum applications for the year, that person will be sent back. They're also going to raise the standard to pass asylum interviews. This is making it harder for people who do claim asylum to actually get that residential uh, be be allowed to stay in the country. Mm. Um, So these are some things in there that Republicans really should be able to bite on, but they're not. Yeah. Because they feel like it needs to go further. Yeah, of course. Yeah, so they want it. They want no <laughs> asylum seekers. Tr- well, what Republicans? What I found that Republicans are specifically sure. going for is two two things that separate them from Biden's proposal. One is they want to completely outlaw, ban asylum for anybody who has traveled through a third country to get to the U.S. border. So that means basically, if you're not coming from Mexico itself then you're not allowed to have asylum, right? That would allow them to deport so many of the illegal arrivals that are happening, right? The majority of these are from Venezuela, Nicaragua, Haiti, Cuba, Cuba, if not from Ukraine and China, right? So that would be, that would basically restrict all asylum. I'm, I'm against that policy just because I think it's completely out against the spirit of asylum the yeah. point of asylum is supposed to be you offer it to people who are most in need who are under persecution from their government it shouldn't matter to us based on that spirit of the law whether they've crossed through another country that just doesn't really make any sense to me i totally agree with you the other point that does make more sense to me that i honestly would be fine with biden compromising on is to only allow asylum seekers to come through legal ports of entry. I do think that is absolutely fair. Yeah. As long as they make it easy. As long as they make it extremely easy for the legal points of entry. Sure. Then, yeah. If you want to beef up the interviews, if you want to put more officers on, Mm -hmm. if you want to make the Border Patrol more secure, if you want to say asylum only through port of entry, I think that is beneficial to everybody. I think it's beneficial because I also think this this would be a great opportunity for Democrats to shift the Overton window. Yes. We talk about the benefits of immigration. We have espoused those benefits so many times on this show. We have a deep dive on it. I would One of our highly best. encourage you to go watch. Yeah, their immigration as a whole is really great for countries, not only their economy, but I would say the culture, right? To have more integration, it makes people more tolerant over time. I think it's a great thing. And... If we can get to a point where we appease Republicans on this, right, where where we're saying, look, we are trying to do something on the border. We do want security there. We want to be able to know and control who comes through. Once we have that, we can start shifting to, okay, let's let more people in because it's a good thing. Exactly. And then there's another part to this where Democrats are really fighting to allow certain migrants to. Um, get work permits expedited so that right after they have their preliminary asylum interviews, they're allowed to start going to work. Yes. And this is exactly what we want to see. Mm -hmm. We don't want to have migrants in this country that are forced to live off local government's dimes. We don't want that. Local communities across the country, Democrat, Republican, nobody wants that. But we all, and we also know that if you're, if you poll the American people, they want to increase border funding and secure the border 
And they don't want to deport any illegal immigrant who currently has a job. And they want to let more legal immigrants in. So let's right? give them that. Exactly. Let's give them that. Let's give all of the business owners who are lacking on labor in in industries like construction, construction. and agriculture. Let's let them have more of a workforce that they can draw from, right? Because mm-hmm. those those industries are disproportionately filled by immigrant workers a lot of the time. It this is going to these can this can fix so many problems. At the same time, as long as we realize that immigration, when done correctly, is a great, extremely helpful thing for the country. Now, a couple weeks ago, we talked about a problem that Canada was having with its immigrants and that its housing shortage was being exacerbated because of all the immigrants it is encouraged to come in. And so what we've also talked about the show on the show, um, which is a huge general progressive liberal talking point is the need for more housing absolutely right and so there are several measures that we can take to get us there we the first deep dive we ever did was on zoning reform encourage you guys to check that out Um, there's a ton of information on the local regulations and requirements that we can loosen up to allow for more housing production if we get these things to happen at the same time it's going to be a massive boost for our economy that lifts everyone up yeah and you have to remember construction companies are clamoring for more immigrants because those are the people who are most likely to work in the construction field and there is a labor shortage yes. you want to build more housing guess what you need to increase your amount of immigrants into the united states totally so this is a really great bipartisan compromise that i am prepared to make as a liberal with republicans i will say that you cannot cross the border if you're an asylum seeker illegally if they are allowed to come in through the ports of entry i am okay with that mm-hmm. another thing republicans are fighting to get rid of that the Biden administration initially was a hard no one, but is now coming around, is Republicans are fighting to include a cap on the number of people who could be let into the country via parole. Now, parole is the legal terminology that allows the White House to resettle migrants throughout the country, allows them to get them into New York, Michigan, Chicago, Los Angeles, wherever. The White House, again, previously was opposed to this, but is now coming around, and I agree with this. I think if we can make a a good asylum process of people coming through the ports of entry with good amount of officers with an expedited uh and with 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 a different um interview process that people can get jobs right away this is the way to do it okay i see i would i would prefer to for parole to stay Mm -hmm. but i'm not married to it exactly like i'm okay with getting rid of it for now if it means that we can make progress on this issue and that people can start to think that the the border crisis isn't so much of a crisis right right, right. So, we need we need to show that we are doing something about the border crisis whether you're a republican democrat there is something going on down there you don't have to be in denial we have a lot of border crossings we need to figure out a better way to handle it this is the better way to handle it and so why aren't republicans on board well senate republicans are mitch mcconnell comes out and he's like i want this we need to do this mm-hmm. this is the way to go Well, House Republicans are not on board, and here is why. This is Representative Troy Nels, who is a Texas Republican on the border, a border state who's supposed to care so much about border security. This is his quote. Let me tell you, I'm not willing to do a damn thing right now that will help a Democrat and help Joe Biden's approval rating. I will not help the Democrats Democrats try try to improve this man's dismal approval ratings. I'm not going to do it. Why would I? What a nightmare of a fucking country we live in. And I'm going to caveat because that is one anecdote. That is one representative. But that's exactly why I would expect that Republicans across the board are opposed to Biden's proposal. For context, Biden proposed this, I think it was October 25th. Yes. That means it's been about two and a half months that his proposal has been on the table for Congress and they have actively not taken it up. Okay. So that means that there, there, there has to be some reason, right? And they can say not enough, but is not enough at all a good reason to do nothing. That's, that's, is, that is the best sentence you've ever said on this fucking show <laughs> is not enough a good reason to do nothing. 
No, of it's not, not a good enough reason. Of course this not. is something. It benefits the liberals on some avenues. It benefits Republicans on others. This limits illegal immigration while increasing legal immigration. That's what we want. Yes. And Republicans aren't giving it to you. The American people, the American people who want it, Republicans are denying that to you for political partisan gain on their behalf. Yep. And you should be furious from that like I am. Like we are. <laughs> Crazy. It's absurd. Absurd. Yeah. So the war in Ukraine is raging on. Um, Western and NATO support has been not as good as Ukraine has hoped. And one of the specific reasons, even cited by the Biden administration, is concerns over how money that we're giving to Ukraine is getting spent locally. Is there corruption? How much of there is it? And is Ukraine doing enough to stop it? Well, there has been an internal audit of the defense ministry, and they have found financial violations over the last four months worth $260 million. This is only over the last four months. And there's $260 million worth of financial violations. That's brutal. Now, the defense minister has vowed that the authorities will respond harshly to all cases. He vows to arrest all the people involved, and he says that arrests will become much more common and widely reported on. He wants to make it specifically clear to the West, to the EU, to NATO, that they are not taking this lightly, that they take corruption seriously, and that they're going to take it head on. Now, this is coming against a defense minister who was uh, Oleski Rezi- Re- Re- Reznikov. Alexei. Alexei. Alexei Reznikov. Ale- Alexei Reznikov. He was not good. At dealing with corruption. He was involved in multiple scandals where people were inflating prices for food suppliers. He was buying low-quality military jackets for troops fighting Russia. So Zelensky fired his ass and appointed uh, Umarov, the new defense minister. And this Umarov guy means business. He is apparently a hard anti-corruption activist in regards to all of this. And this is really so that Ukraine can keep the money spigot coming from the EU and the United States. Yeah. As a U.S. citizen, I don't want to give this country money if they're going to piss it on way, piss it away on overspending on food and buying the wrong types of jackets just to make some other guy rich. Totally, of course no, not. That's unacceptable. No, no, it's totally unacceptable. And you know, as someone who firmly supports Ukraine, I can have both of those positions, and I am happy to see Zelensky fire the corrupt guy put in an anti-corruption activist and really take the problem head on and not pussyfoot around it and lie about it to Western media. Yeah, well, it's nice that we kind of can be conditional in our support of Ukraine because they need our support, right? True. So, yeah, we should be saying you need to use this money right if you want this money at all. Yeah, exactly. And Zelensky is also going hard on regional military recruitment centers. In August, just a few months ago, he fired a lot of heads of these regional military recruitment centers who were taking bribes for people from people who were trying to avoid fighting. So if they were getting drafted, they were paying off their draft. Mm. And Zelensky is putting a stop to that. He has also increased transparency in the defense procurement um, uh, to uh, Umarov from Umarov's defense ministry into Zelensky's office and then making it widely available to the United States and Western allies so that there is full transparency in where all the money is going. And this is vitally important. We had we tied a talk about EU countries, Slovakia, Hungary, who are citing the corruption problems in Ukraine and saying we're not giving any more money to this corrupt country. It's also stopping Ukraine from joining NATO and joining the European Union. European Union has corruption standards. NATO has corruption standards. And NATO has a bunch of other standards, too, like talking about how weapons are delivered and how and how troops are being trained. Well, Ukraine is already in the process of abiding by those corruption standards or at least moving in that direction and going to NATO operation protocol so that when the time comes, they can get in there and join when ready. Yeah. Yeah, they, they just need to do this to show credibility like they listen the West wants to help and they want to bring Ukraine into their institutions but they the West isn't willing to degrade their own credibility on Ukraine's account yet even though they do want to stand up to Russia yeah we want to get Ukraine into our institutions but we're not going to let our institutions suffer because of it exactly and so I'm really glad Zelensky is taking this head on it's a positive step if you have concerns about Ukraine funding this step from Zelensky should make you more happy about it totally and should bring you a peace of mind yeah I mean this is this is how you progress right? definitely all right next topic I want to switch over to our other geopolitical rival China 
and where the United States is positioned in the Pacific. So there are interesting talks about should the United States form a NATO equivalent in the Pacific to counteract China, Iran, and Iran, and North Korea. So surprisingly, uh, New York Representative Mike Lawler, who we've talked about before, he's one of the moderate Republicans who's in a Biden district, he actually proposed a very interesting bill that would enable a fact-finding panel to create the and that would uh, be the first step in creating an Indo-Pacific version of NATO. He says that it is crucial that the democracies of the region and the world work in unison to combat this rising threat. I'm very impressed with that language. I'm impressed with that forth uh, with that forethought. Um, I, I really like this bill a lot. Okay, I'm a, I'm in huge support. Um, if uh, a lot of analysts have been studying this for a while now, and they presume that any type of NATO equivalent that arises in the Pacific will come out of the quad, uh, the quadrilateral security dialogue. Um, the quadrilateral the quad quadrilateral, quadrilateral. security dialogue yeah. is a, a, a unison of Australia, India, Japan, and the United States. And it was proposed by Shinzo Abe back in like the uh, late 2000s. That's cool. Yeah. And so out of this, Analysts think a NATO equivalent could possibly grow, but other analysts are very skeptical, and they even suggest that a United States-led partnership would even be possible. So professors at the University of Tokyo say that there is a lack of trust among many of the governments in the region. I think a good example would be actually Vietnam and the Philippines. We talk a lot about uh, China pushing into the South China Sea and China pushing for controlling islands that are technically the Philippines and islands that are technically the Vietnamese. Well, the Philippines and the Vietnamese have conflicting relationships with those islands as well. Yes. And they also have their own national interests of the Vietnamese wanting some Philippine islands and the Philippine islands wanting some of the Vietnamese islands. So it's very difficult to thread that needle. Um, he also says that there's just too much bureaucracy in NATO. And it took a lot of time for that bureaucracy to develop, and it can't be built overnight. Yeah, I would also point out the my fear here is what if uh, what if talks of an Indo-Pacific NATO, what if they scare China? What if they urge China into action? Right. Whereas otherwise, China might slowly like China might get more and more they more tensions rising more and more right trying to unify Taiwan into the country and eventually. They get to the point where they realize they're not going to be strong enough. That's not going to be worth it to challenge the West to do it. But there are some who have argued that the reason that Russia invaded Ukraine at the time that it did yeah. is because of discussions about Ukraine joining NATO or joining the EU. And Russia felt too strongly that Ukraine had to be part of its bloc. Well, something like that could absolutely happen with a NATO in the Indo-Pacific, especially depending on what the Taiwanese government said about their own potential involvement or alliance with, or yeah, alliance with that larger alliance. No, exactly. And analysts are also suggesting that the status quo is working. I, they, they feel like, listen, we have some internal conflicts with all these partner nations, but at the end of the day, we have some things that are working, like bilateral and multilateral agreements in the region that are making progress to deter Chinese aggression yes. without pushing them so hard that a NATO equivalent would do, right? Mm -hmm. So we have the um, Australia-United Kingdom-United States partnership, AUKUS, um, and the Association of Southeast Asian Nations. These countries are working together in these multilateral bilateral agreements that are in a way, combating China without being so aggressively a NATO equivalent. Exactly. Which is better to operate in that gray zone that we talk about all the time yes. than to literally say, hey, China, this is our organization to stop your expansion. Yeah, I I don't think I like it. I, I can, again, as we talk about the idea of China, China really does kind of express dominion over most of the South China Sea. And it... it um, uh, it in, it infringes upon islands that are, according to international law, um, they belong to the Philippines. They belong to Japan. So I can see the motivation behind a move like this being so that China is no longer allowed to impede upon those areas. Yeah. But the cost, you ha always have to go back to the cost and the benefit. And the cost of a wider war in the Indo-Pacific 
is far too high than something we should try to bear when we do already have these um, alliances that work quite well. Yeah. Right. And that we can slowly continue to build out. But I will say this. We're saying this because we live on in January 11th, 2024. We don't know what comes next. True. So like we say it's working well now, but how well does this work for? Could a NATO equivalent automatically say, look, we're a block. We're defended. Mm -hmm. We are in lockstep with one another trying to back off. Would that work better for the future? I don't know. But yeah. Um, one of the bilateral agreements, uh, multilateral agreements that I think is really, really beneficial is an agreement that Japan has recently signed with Malaysia and the Philippines, where Japan now has authority to patrol the South China Sea in between Malaysia and the Philippines um, and really push back against Beijing and their expansionist policies in the region. Yeah, that's right? really good because our like the U.S. Navy is the body that has been doing the most as far as trying to secure the international freedom of navigation in the South China Sea, um, with which China obviously contests. And as our Navy is spread thinner and kind of declines as far as, as its abil- as its total numbers and its ability to project itself around the world in mass, especially compared to China's Navy, which now is technically bigger than ours, though still technologically behind ours, bringing our allies in to do a little bit more of that work as far as just having more boats in the water to establish presence is a big deal and very helpful. Definitely. And there's also a whole nother angle to this, which really puts a big wrench in the plan of trying to build a NATO equivalent. A lot of these countries don't want that. A lot of these countries are very, very happy trying to balance the two giants on the world stage and really operate as this middleman and are actually excited by the prospect of a multipolar world. Vietnam is an example of this. Mm -hmm. We have great relationships with Vietnam, but Vietnam also recently hosted Xi in their country, and they've also had very productive talks. So Vietnam is one of those countries that's trying to balance these two powers out, trying to keep them both happy. They don't want to pick a side. Yeah, the power of competition, right? right? The fruits of competition. Yeah. The U.S. and China are both both competing (laughs) competing for the admiration, the affection, the closeness of Vietnam. And if I were them, that's how I'd be playing it. Why why would Vietnam pick a side? Of course not. Unless until China does something extremely horrendous, which might be coming... Why pick a side? China is on the verge of doing something horrendous. Possibly. The Taiwanese elections are tomorrow, January 13th. And this is a big deal. The entire international community is watching. The Taiwanese people will be electing their nation's parliament and their president. Now, China is currently opposed to the current ruling party of Taiwan, which is the Democratic Progressive Party. These guys are Western aligned, socially liberal, uh, social Democrat light. That's kind of where their politics lay. And China is against them wholeheartedly. Uh, She is framing the election as a choice between war and peace, prosperity and decline. She delivered a fresh warning to this effect in his New Year's Eve speech when he declared that the reunification of the motherland is a historical inevitability. The Taiwanese people are in danger, and America needs to be completely prepared for this. It is vital that we are prepared for this. And I, I assume they are. I mean, again, this this rhetoric from Xi is not unclear. Right. It, it is blatant and blatantly obvious. If we're unprepared, it's our fault. Totally. Absolutely. So the ruling party of Taiwan, like I said, is the Democratic Progressive Party. It is aligned with the West, democratic values, and they have been a good partner to the United States. Now, the front runner in this race is the DPP. This is the current ruling party, like I said, and it champions Taiwan's de facto sovereignty and separate identity from China completely. That's basically what this party's platform is is. These elections in Taiwan, we'll talk about this, but is really boiling boiling down to Chinese influence. How much do you want it? How much do you hate it? Except for one of the candidates, but we'll get into that. Um, The current party's front runner, La Ching Te, he originally advocated for a hard line push for independence, a hard line push, specifically saying he wants to break up what's going on. He wants to totally get out of the Chinese one 
China ambiguity and declare his independence. But uh, he has since moderated this position actually from because of signs from Washington. Washington basically alluded that this was way too intense yeah. of rhetoric, and they don't want to poke the bear that is China right now. Exactly. They need to stay in a gray area. And I think that she's rhetoric might be just coercion tactics to try to prevent voting for a candidate that's too Mm anti-China. But again, this is all dynamic, right? So the more that this Taiwanese president goes against China, the more that they threaten separation from China, the more likely it is that she actually does make a military move and everything goes to hell. Exactly. Um, And he, uh, this guy Lai has said that, uh, Sorry, so Beijing is totally against the DPP and have called the leading candidate a war maker and a destroyer of cross-strait peace. I like what you said. I think you're right. They are trying specifically to convince the people of Taiwan to vote against the DPP, the DPP for the purposes of keeping peace between China and Taiwan. Mm-hmm. They're trying to scare the Taiwanese people into voting against their interests here. Totally. So now in opposition, we have the, the KMT. This is uh, the old ruling party of the Republic of China that that goes back 100 years ago. Um, But this party blames the DPP, the Democratic People's Progressive Party, for provoking China. And they advocate peaceful relations. I put that in quotations because is what's going on right now truly peaceful relations? It's hard for me to truly tell if this is technically peaceful. It seems like there's so much backwards coercion going on that calling this peaceful is very difficult. It, it is difficult, especially because uh, con- not confrontation, that's not the word. Tensions have been rising. China's been running more military exercises near Taiwan, right? It's been flying more of its aircraft around the island. It's it's trying to scare it more and more clearly. Mm-hmm. So no, there, there haven't been any attacks between the island and the mainland. But it's hard to call it purely peaceful. Exactly. So the KMT is pushing for um, keeping an open dialogue with the Chinese, but what's most importantly is boosting their economic ties. So the DPP is basically looking to almost, we say this word a lot too, decouple from China in their economics. They don't want to be reliant on China at all, Mm -hmm. and they totally want to be reliant on the West, Western markets, South Korea, Japan, Australia, the United States, um, India to an extent. They want to be involved with those countries. They don't want to be involved with China. The KMT is the opposite of that spectrum. Then we have another interesting candidate, uh, Ko Win Jae. Ko Win Jae, he he is the leader of the Taiwan's People's Party, the TPP, um, which was founded only in 2019, a very new party. And his candidacy is really interesting to me because mm. he's not really talking about the China problem. He is focusing his campaign on bread and butter issues specifically. He's talking about the rising cost of housing, and he's talking about stagnant wages. He's very, very popular with young people and with members of the working class. That is where his lane is. Interesting. He's really not trying to make this election about China. He's trying to go above that. Now, I will say this person was previously in the KMT. So on his Chinese stances, he may be more KMT leaning in that regard, but that is not the focus of his campaign he's focused on economic issues it's very interesting to me because okay based on the coalitions you say he has which are working class people and younger people it sounds like progressives to me yeah exactly and yet these bread and butter issues that doesn't sound like progressive politics to me that sounds like republican politics to me you think do you not think well rising housing costs and stagnant wages no you're right progressives do do talk about that. Okay, maybe, maybe I'm... Maybe no, no, I'm no, but I do think I know what you're talking about. Republicans always say that they care about the cost of living and all of that, with mm-hmm. inflation being a problem, um, but yes. they blame it on things other. I don't know the intricacies of his political ideology, mm. so I can't say where his critiques of these problems come from. Yeah, well, right? well maybe it's just maybe it's just different in Taiwan where the, the China shadow looms so large that it makes sense to talk about the Democratic Progressive Party, the DPP, and the Kuomintang, 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 yeah, I can try the KMT, um, in that from that perspective, and when you talk about working class people and young people, it's like they have other more personal things that are more pressing to worry about. Yes, yeah, and I think it's and look, we talk in the United States all the time. The United States doesn't care about foreign policy that much. The electorate doesn't care. Mm. Our government cares a lot, but our electorate. We don't really give a shit. Yeah. We voted for Obama because he was against the war in Iraq, right? 
That's why we voted for Obama. Okay. The, one of the main reasons. But um, now I want to go back to Taiwan here. Taiwan is seeing an increase in anti-Chinese sentiment. Mm. Less than 3% of the people in Taiwan identify themselves primarily as Chinese. Wow. And less than 10% support an immediate or eventual unification. Yeah. So it has now become extremely popular uh, to be against Chinese unification. And if China goes in and invades Taiwan, they're going to have a hell of a fight on their hands if these numbers are accurate. Oh, yeah. Oh, I mean, they're definitely going to have a hell of a fight on their hands. It's not China invading Taiwan. I mean, I've I've listened to podcasts. I've read some articles about the, the potential here. Like, it would not... We thought Russia going into Ukraine would be easy right would be them wiping them out right taiwan is a small island and china is a map the second largest country in the world with a massive economy but the fact that they're an island like it would be and they're a far more advanced economy than ukraine like it would be an absolute brutal dogfight. and i can i just think about how the Chinese culture has to be so much different from the Taiwanese culture, mm-hmm. having evolved for the past 60, 70 years yep. in democracy and like in a liberal democracy. Democracy versus autocracy. Exactly. This is the perfect epitome of that moment. Yes, with massive, um, with massive, oh, I'm forgetting the word. And it's such an obvious, easy word um, where the government clamps down on the communication that happens in a place censorship yes with enormous censorship in china and taiwan totally connected to the rest of the world like mm-hmm. it's just there's to it wouldn't make any sense for the taiwanese to really identify with the chinese besides they look like us right that's the only thing they have left or truly in common they have totally integrated themselves with western markets yes. western media western values exactly so there's really there's not much left of the Beijing relationship yeah. to unify on. Totally. Now, again, ahead of the election, China is putting the pressure. They are sending fighter jets over the country, drones, warships uh, to, to patrol around the waters. They have flown balloons over the island. And the Taiwanese defense minister is saying that this is psychological warfare to affect the morale of our people. This goes two ways for China, I think. Mm. I think it either truly in, uh, reignites a, a, a flame for Taiwanese. And I shouldn't say reignites, just continues to grow the flame of Taiwanese independence feeling within the hearts of the Taiwanese people. And it makes them angry that they have to live in fear of this of this autocratic state yeah. across their shores, or it makes them scared. And I, I think this election is in between, are you scared or are you going to stand up for your independence in Taiwan? That's how I view the election. I'm not Taiwanese. I'm not there. Yeah. This and is so, from a Western audience, but so which it. way do you think it falls? Well, if based we look on at that. if we look at current polling, the DPP sits at 36 percent. Mm-hmm. The KM the the KMT sits at 31 percent, and that third party candidate, the TPP, sits at 24. Mm-hmm. Polling in Taiwan, from what I've seen, has been fairly accurate as compared to the United States polling. So there is a chance that these polls are accurate and and the dpp wins outright um we'll have to see if i had a bet on it i would say dpp pulls through which would be the first time in taiwan's history that the same party rules the country for three consecutive presidential terms Mm. wow it'd be a big deal okay that's what makes it hard for the dpp right now is they they've already had two consecutive presidents there has never been a third consecutive president of the same party in the country's history okay yeah i i it's really hard for me. I So I recently read a paper on the sentiments of the Ukrainian people on the invasion of Russia. And like, basically, how far would you want to go in fighting this war? I'm sorry, do you mean the Russian people in the invasion of Ukraine? No. Oh, you mean the Ukrainian people yes. in the invasion of their country by Russia? Yes. Okay. Yes. So, and the, the paper kind of, what the paper found is like, they don't really care about how much they have to lose to maintain their country they are they want to they don't care about the losses of of men of soldiers they want all of their land and they want to fight down to the last bit for it and maybe my view is colored from that but i just imagine that a taiwanese person would want to say fuck the man right more than they would want to say let's make sure they don't come for us right i agree and i feel like now if you're taiwanese the u.s has your back more than ever right now we're selling them weapons right we're talking with them all the time 
Absolutely. I do want to say just one more thing about these polling averages. It is kind of interesting that the KMT is on this upward trajectory. There was a point um, over the last few months where the KMT was actually below that third party candidate. Yeah. And only recently over the last few months, the KMT started catching up. I agree, which does seem to imply that China's aggression Did has had something. an effect. Yeah, that's a really good point. All it seems like there was something going on there. Although there's also been that rise has really tapered off in the past month, which is when oh. China's right, which is when China's aggression has gone even further. Yes. But you know what? I actually I. Because I'm not an expert on Taiwanese politics, there was something else I read that I forgot. You see that gray line at the bottom? That, Some dropped out. That was a dropout. I see. And that person was, they that party then aligned with the KMT. Oh, okay. So two parties combined to make the current KMT ticket. Yeah. That's why we saw the increase. That makes a lot of more sense. Because if totally you add good. those two together, it's exactly where he's at now. Yep. So, okay. That, that adds up. Okay. Okay. Yeah. So that's the Taiwanese election, folks. If you're in Taiwan and you're watching this video, that's fucking awesome. Go vote. Yeah. <laughs> please vote. God, I, it'll be so fun to talk about that. I know. I know. And I feel like I shouldn't say it's so fun to talk about no, that. No, because it's your lives. About... <laughs> it's literally your livelihood. It's the threat of you being invaded by China. God forbid. Oh, my God. Our hearts are with you, and uh, so will our weapons be with you as well. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Let's get back to United States politics. This is so fucking important people mm. i can't express to you how deeply i feel about this topic there is one thing i care about more than anything else and it's feeding kids okay well it's a pretty good thing to care it's about a pretty good thing to care about right I, I feel like my heart's in the right place with that one guys yeah. so um i'm just going to start out right off the bat republican governors across the country are denying getting free lunches to kids so a new federally funded program which was developed under the biden administration is titled summer electronic benefit transfer summer ebt it is set to launch this summer in 2024 it will provide 120 dollars per child um, over the course of the summer for families to shop at grocery stores farmers markets or other authorized retailers so this Love. is to make up this is a great idea. Yes, I mean, this is just fantastic. This. Yeah. This is to make up the gap for those kids who get free lunch at school because their families are struggling. But over the summer, they no longer have that access to that free meal every day. Mm -hmm. So this is trying to close that gap. So again, this will apply to all families who currently receive aid through the school lunch program or the school breakfast program. Unfortunately, this is a bureaucratic thing that I don't like. Families are not automatically enrolled, so they still have to apply for the summer EBT program. So if your child is enrolled in the NSLP or the SBP, please look into the summer EBT program and get enrolled as soon as possible. It's not going to happen automatically. You have to make the step to do that. Please do that ASAP. Yeah, we, we don't talk about this all the time on this show, but I think we've brought it up occasionally. Administrative burden to keep people out of these welfare programs is enormously harmful. And it is terrible that automatic enrollment isn't a thing. It should not only be a thing for the summer EBT program, but it should be a thing for national school lunch and school breakfast. It should be something that's automatically done through the IRS, that they read your tax return. They're like, okay, we know how much money you made. You made below this amount of money. Here's your EBT card that we're sending to you. Exactly. Right? It should be all working together. But what makes it difficult is a lot of these executive branches, I'm um, sorry, not executive branches, executive offices can't communicate with each other. Mm. They're not allowed to share data. They're not allowed to. A lot, of the, a lot of cases, they're not legally allowed to share data. Do you know why? Um, that's ridiculous. No, I don't know okay. why. But that, that's a, I think that might actually be a holdover from the New Deal that was never... Dumb. A dumb, bro. Dumb. Yeah. So this program, the Summer EBT program, is fucking awesome, guys. It will serve, expected to serve, 21 million people and will cost $199 per kid. So it's $120 per kid to spend. And it only costs $199 per kid. That's because of the way that the, the U.S. government is able to procure funds for stuff like this. And it's able to generate it, it, it is it gets reduced rates for goods based off of this stuff. OK, I see when I saw one ninety nine. I don't know if I completely understand. Like, like what do you mean reduced rates for goods? So like the $120 per eligible child. Sure. Right. That $120 of an EBT card might be equivalent to 130 real dollars. All right, that's not a point. That's not the point of the story. The point is 21 million kids are getting fed. Yes, yes. Okay. The no, way I got that number was the overall price of the program, which is 2.5 billion divided by the 21 million. Okay. It was $199 per kid. Yeah, so it's like so my my understanding was that means about $80 of administration 
expenses per kid, more or less. Right? Oh, yes. Right? Sure. That's that makes the sense. difference between the 120 that the kid yes. gets yes, 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 and what's left over. Yes. So which I, that's actually insanely bad. Yeah. That, I think that, I mean, that means that the kids are only getting 60% of the total money being spent on this. And that's atrocious. Which is exactly why we need automatic enrollment. Right. Because that's so much of that $80 is because we don't have the automatic enrollment. In exactly. Place. exactly. So now. We have 35 states signed on to this with also all the U.S. territories and all the Indian reservations on board with the summer EBT program. Mm -hmm. But there are some states that are not taking part, specifically 15 states. And Republican states specifically are refusing to participate. Iowa Governor Kim Reynolds, this is the lady who endorsed Ron DeSantis. I just want to make it clear. Last night when I was reading this, I was drinking tea and I literally started choking because I couldn't believe what she says here, okay? Iowa Governor Gib, uh, Kim Reynolds said that no, that saw no need to add money to a program that helps food insecure youths when childhood obesity has become an epidemic. <laughs> what is happening? How can we take these people seriously? We, I, I can't even fathom what is going through her head, dude. That means that there's food insecurity on a worse level. It means the kids only have access to shit, calorie-rich, garbage food that's making their lives shorter and giving them diabetes. That's what's happening here. And these EBT programs going to farmer's markets and grocery stores is a way for the kid to have access to better, healthier, more nutritious food that makes the kid more be that's going to make the kid better in school. That's going to give him better opportunities in the long run. And you're saying, no, nah, just shove a stupid McDouble down their throat. Do you know if how much the obesity epidemic touches poor kids? I honestly don't. Okay. I honestly don't. Because but I, I do know that food insecurity is on the rise, and we could talk about that. Yeah. But there is massive food insecurity that's on the rise, specifically because COVID-era welfare programs are ending. And because of that, states don't have the resources to pick up where COVID money left off. Well, I, I just want to make the, the I guess, slightly calmer, logical Sorry. rebuke to, to what she said about uh, childhood obesity becoming an epidemic does not mean that poor kids that can't afford food are becoming obese and that we don't have to enable them to have food. I just want to point out that very clear, like, like childhood obesity becoming an epidemic could mean 20% of kids are obese. And all of those obese kids could have enormous access to food that this still, whatever, I think we're going to talk about like 8% of, of households with kids are food insecure. Like those two things do not have to overlap at all. And the fact that there is one portion that is eating too much does not mean anything about the portion that literally cannot get enough to eat. Yes, there, I, I, there is literally no relationship between the two things. Yeah. It's just, it blows my mind. It's just so, it, it's so non-compassionate. Yeah, yeah. non-compassionate is the right word. And here we go. We have another Republican governor who's non-compassionate, Nebraska Governor um, Jim Pillen. He said bluntly that I don't believe in welfare. He said that the program was unnecessary and is not adequate to meeting the needs of children. Handing out money is not enough to make kid to meet kids' needs. They need much more. How about we just start with food, man? Yeah. What did we just say about <laughs> doing something versus doing nothing? Not enough <laughs> is not an excuse to, to do, do nothing. nothing. That should be our fucking slogan. Yeah. That's awesome. But dude, I can't stand this fucking guy. We're talking about kids who are food insecure children. I don't believe in welfare. Unnecessary. It is unnecessary. I'm sorry. It's unnecessary to feed the kids. What do you mean it's not adequate? I. You know what's what I, not adequate about this? What you know what's not adequate? Doing nothing. Saying, oh yeah, we know you get free lunch during the school year, and you're not gonna have access to that lunch over the summer. But that's your problem now, kiddo. Go yeah. talk to your parents about it who don't have enough money. Well, that's that's the thing that I think I hate the most about this is the fact that he like starts to say 
the true reasonings behind his belief and then hedges, right? I don't believe in welfare. That's where he's coming from. He's coming from, well, I think if you want food, your parents should be good enough to work for it and earn the money to get you that food. But what he then goes on to say is it's unnecessary and it's not adequate to meet the needs of the children. That's clearly false. That's demonstrably false. But the point is it's a it's a philosophical belief on the part of Governor Jim Pillen. Right. It's not it's not practical. It's not rooted in logic or reality. It's ideological. Yes. And the more and more I do this show, I become more and more enraged at ideologues. I become more and more enraged at the people who practice purity and believes things because they read it in a book. Yeah. How about you study what's going on in the real world and look at the situation at the time and do the right thing to meet the moment. Exactly. And when you have 21 million kids who could get food and you're choosing not to because it goes against your philosophy, maybe your philosophy is the problem. Yeah, totally. I mean, ideology is, it's, it's just ideology is easy. It's It's easy easy to stick to, and it's easy to communicate. It's easy to get people on board with, but it doesn't solve problems. Exactly. And right now, this is where the federal government is trying to solve a problem. I want to give a little more credit to Kim Reynolds, even though she deserves none. She does make the argument that there are enough direct feeding sites to help everyone in need, like food pantries and not not food pantries, actually, not even that, like places kids can go to get a free lunch certain points out of the summer. But only... Studies have shown that only one in six children who are eligible for summer, uh, who are eligible for the summer EBT program, make it to f- to summer feeding sites, which makes all the sense in the world. It's more burden. Yes, it's more burden. They're less likely to be able to afford it, and they're less likely to have a parent around during the time that they're looking for lunch to get them to one of those sites. So there we go. And this is all coming at a time when hunger in the United States is on the rise. So when Kim Reynolds says childhood obesity, epidemic, bah, 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 hunger in the United States is on the rise. Food insecurity rates increased sharply, with 17.3% of households with children lacking enough food. That is up from 12.5% in 2021, a 5% increase in food insecurity among our youth. And this is... I, I, I want to. I just want to be nuanced about this because I looked into this data. Okay. Mo- so about half of that seventeen point three percent, only the adults in the households with the kids are food insecure. Gotcha. Right. Because the good thing is these adults are making sure their kids have food before they do. Right. Which They're still, sacrificing for themselves so that their kids can eat. Which is still not a good thing, but I I, I think it's noble of them. Um. But I just don't want to misconstrue how many kids themselves are actually going food insecure. Yeah, good yeah. point, good point. Oklahoma is another example where they're going to be facing a lot of shortfall because their their governor did not accept this program. There are 350,000 children in need that um, were getting assistance for the past four summers, but now all of that money has dried up and there is no statewide replacement. Nonprofit assistance groups are sounding the fire alarm and are scrambling to fill the gap. This is just totally unacceptable. And listen, the federal government has to step in here. Mm. I care so deeply, equally, about the urban poor and working class in Boston and New York as deeply as I do about the rural poor, rural working class in Oklahoma and West Virginia. We are one coalition of working people in this country, and we need to know who our enemies are. And I say the word enemies not as like a as a as a vitriolic hatred of the person, but just know who your political enemy is, because the person who's choosing not to feed your child is not the person you should be voting for. Totally. And I think on a also on an executive or administrative level, it doesn't make sense to treat these problems as differently based on locality, right? It's just these are poor people, these are poor families that don't have enough money to feed their children. I don't think that you really need an intricate understanding of the specific state to try to treat that. And I, I, it frustrates me with federal law that the president can't come down and just say, okay, people of Oklahoma, here's your food. It sure. sucks that it has to go through the governor and the governor has to accept this funding. Yeah. That frustrates me a lot. Yeah. One thing I will say, I want, I want to, because I want to flip something on the bright side, like weirdly a, a benefit of the pandemic is like these programs 
wouldn't have had the context to ever arise if it weren't for the pandemic. We're about to talk about um, worker ownership, and there's some, there's, there's a lot of historical instances of contexts where only because things get really bad are people are the systems built to create to enable more good well think about the new deal that's the history of the new deal exactly the, the history of social security uh the history of all, all of these programs that we take for granted the history of the tennessee valley authority the history of the sec the history of all of our security regulations of glass steagall of separating commercial from investment banking which went away in the 90s but point is all of these amazing things happened in times of crisis to meet the moment. Yeah, well, it's it's interesting because it's like, okay, crisis happens and we realize we can't allow people to get this low. And so we institute a bunch of reforms and welfare to help people who have gotten that low in the crisis to get back up. And then at least parts of those reforms stay. stay as part of the system. And right? not all of them do. We have seen an erosion of the social welfare system built up from the COVID era. Totally. With the expansion of the uh, uh, child tax credit being gone away. But some are sticking. And this is one example of a thing that we cannot live, yeah. let slip away. And it, well, the problem is that historically, these things also deteriorate like slowly and slowly. Like over time, there seems to be less, because they are so helpful, mm -hmm. there seems to be less need for them. And so then there's less funding to keep them going. And then things deteriorate and deteriorate until you get to another crisis. Yep. But we have to keep these around as long as we can. Yes. Beautiful. Yeah. Dude, that was so good. <laughs> Thank you. All right. Now, let's talk about Another thing that happened during COVID that might have shown us a new path to getting more teachers in the classroom. Mm. I saw this article and it was so interesting. So the question is, do teaching licenses actually raise standards? Does it actually help kids to have teachers fully licensed? Well, a good example is the state of Massachusetts. And this study was done by Boston University Wheelock College. This is our alma mater. We graduated from there. Um, they collaborated with the education officials in Massachusetts government. And they have seen evidence that so far in the short term, reducing licensing requirements might not affect educational outcomes at all. So, do, and we always talk about cutting the unnecessary red tape. Totally. And this might be an example of, hey, maybe we were onto something. So due to COVID disrupting normal teacher certification procedures like in-person student teaching, the Massachusetts authorized an emergency teaching license in June of 2020. So this meant individuals could functionally begin teaching with just a bachelor's degree. Um, and they eventually would get caught up through the traditional requirements once their emergency licenses expired. So they brought in these teachers with emergency licenses to specif specifically fill in the gaps left by COVID. So how did the students do in classes that were taught by emergency teachers versus the quote unquote professional teachers? Well, by looking at the math and English exams, there was absolutely no statistical difference between students performance who were taught with the provisional teachers and the emergency licensed teachers. This is fascinating because this really puts into question the whole way that we deal with hiring teachers mm -hmm. and how we do with like, are we waiting too long to get teachers in there? Are we decreasing um, necessary competition in becoming a teacher mm -hmm. by limiting it with these licensing requirements? Mm -hmm. Um, it's really fascinating that student performance was literally unchanged at all. Totally. It, it, I must say, it reminds me of our charter school discussion. I know. And you were very, you like the idea of a common core. Because I do. you like the idea of a structure that ensures a common learning, a common education across the nation. Mm -hmm. I think this, like teacher accreditation kind of sounds like that to me. Oh, I don't. Right. Commonality amongst teachers. You know that all teachers meet a certain standard. And so this is getting rid of a little bit of that red tape. No, 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 no. I disagree students. entirely because all these students are taking the exact same exam and being performed based off that. They're being measured with the same exams. I mean, it's it's a different category, but it's still the idea of you don't need everyone to you don't need them to meet a specific criteria that is set. To be determined as qualified mm. just like with a curriculum you right. don't need it to meet a certain criteria that is set for it to be a good curriculum okay maybe maybe, maybe. so maybe maybe so yeah but I, I i just think it's 
really good that if we could expand this yes. and study this in the future, maybe we could eliminate these teacher accreditations that take so long and are costly yeah. for people who want to become a teacher. Yeah, and, and just keep people out. I mean, there's costliness, but there's also time and effort. Well, that, that they asked the teachers, what was the number one reason that you don't have a license yet? And they said the number one thing holding them back was the time. It takes a long time. These people have children. Yeah, exactly. It takes a long time to do this type of stuff. And honestly, we might just have too much red tape getting teachers into classrooms. I know this is specific to Massachusetts, and Massachusetts has an amazing educational system, but perhaps it could be better with more teachers that don't have to go through the rigmarole of getting these licenses that add zero value to student performance. I mean, I think it's I think it's clear once you put it as that it adds zero value. I'm person like in my personal life, I've always been a person I've always hated kind of what I see is unnecessary red tape. Nothing makes me more angry than bureaucracy. Yeah, right. I mean, think about it, the college degree. And I think this is a pretty widely spread idea now. But you know, after going through college, college can be a massive educational opportunity. It can make you enormously prepared for a job. But if you go through college and you go through these classes, you also know that someone who has taken a completely different path could be far more qualified for a job that decides to take you just because you have the piece of paper. Totally. Right? So I think the more we can identify where the bureaucracy, where the piece of paper is given way more value than it's actually worth and get rid of the need for that, the more kind of we're going to almost unclog the economy, right? And I think it's really important to say as people who identify as liberals, as progressives, we don't want regulation for regulation's sake. Exactly. We don't want government to get in the way of good markets no. doing their thing. Yeah. That's I, not what we want. I think we talk loudly and often about the downsides of red tape. I mean, obviously in the housing sector is the biggest, the clearest, but um, we're also about to talk about how U.S. emissions dropped in 2023. And I think we might as well move on to that. Yeah, let's do it. And they did drop. In 2023, they dropped about 2% from 2022 levels, but I think these could have dropped a lot more and we could have made a lot more progress on generating more renewable energy if we didn't have so much government red tape that was getting in the way of building some of the some of the infrastructure that we need for it. No, totally. And this emissions reduction of 2% is very exciting news. It's hard to be so, say, oh, it's so exciting because we need to reduce it so much more yeah. than 2%. But at least we're on the right track and we're going down after years of honestly flatlining. So under the Trump administration, we really saw no reduction in emissions of notability. We saw reductions in uh, power, but uh, buildings were really seeing no progress, transportation or others, or really nothing to note there. But um, what makes this such an interesting year is not just did our emissions decline, but our economy grew. And that is something that I think is amazing. So we saw a 2.4% GDP increase in 2023 with a 2% reduction in carbon emissions. What this says is we don't need to burn to grow anymore. True. We have decoupled carbon emissions from economic growth. Yes. And that is only going to explode in the years to come as we build out our green energy uh, grid, energy grid. Yeah. It's only going to get easier and easier. This is the largest decline since 2016, obviously excluding the COVID years. This 2% decline is the largest since 2016. Um this decline of emissions was driven mostly by an 8% drop in emissions from the power sector. We talk about that the power sector used to be the most emitting sector of our economy. Not anymore. The power sector is now third with transportation, industry being one and two, buildings being a very, very far bottom. But power has now become lower than industry. To, to not mislead power dropped below transport in 2016 yes. and dropped below industry in about 2018, 2019. Yes. So another good thing about this is that coal is playing less and less of a role on the power grid. Um, natural gas and renewable generations are filling the gap mm -hmm. uh, to, uh, to accommodate for that. We saw a brief uptick in generation in 2021 um, with you know all the COVID craziness. Uh, but coal has continued its long-term decline and only now makes up 
of our overall power generation in 2023. This is now another record low, which is providing the U.S. power in 2023 as much as it did in 1969, which is just really... That's great. It's really awesome. That is great progress. It really is. Yeah. But it is not enough. The United States needs to meet our 2030 climate target under the Paris Climate Agreement, which is a 50 to 52% reduction in our carbon in our greenhouse gas emissions below the 2005 levels. This 2005 level was when the United States peaked in its carbon emission. Well, because of this deadline rapidly approaching, it is getting harder and harder to meet this deadline. To put that in perspective, the United States needs to average a 6.9 emissions decline every year from 2024 to 2030. That is more than triple our current reduction rate of 1.9 in 2023. Yeah. This is a nightmare. Now, there are some things that are exciting about this. The research team from Princeton has estimated that the Inflation Reduction Act will result in an economy-wide emission reduction between 43 and 48 percent below 2005 levels close to the Paris climate levels, that 48 number is very, very close to 50, um, but not close enough. Yeah, and also, it's, it's, it's reaching that by 2035, not 2030. not 2030. What we've said now twice on the show is not doing enough is not an excuse for doing nothing. Another corollary to that would be that not doing enough means do more. Right. We're not doing enough. We have to do more. Exactly. It is good that we made some progress here, admittedly. It is not close to enough. I, I, it frustrates me. Um, I, I'm almost, I'm skeptical to spin this in any positive light. Okay. Because I think anyone seeing this that might find any relief from these numbers needs to be completely mm. dispelled. And I'm very much, we, we were just having a conversation before this about not wanting to put people in a, uh, an excessively negative echo chamber. Make them fearful, scared. Yes. Just That's not the, our goal. Just for the sake of trying to propel them into something. If there was anything to be fearful or upset or angry or want to do something about, it is this. It is this. That it is, is perfect. How much greenhouse gases we are emitting? How much are we contributing to climate change? How much are we doing to combat it? Yes. And we are not doing nearly enough so the inflation reduction act is expected to double our current pace so up from two percent to four percent annually reductions again we need to hit seven percent yes you know what that tells me we need an inflation reduction act part two a couple years from now no literally i mean we preferably faster this is the thing about politics right because the inflation reduction act is still fresh in our minds we think We've we've done our part on that for now. Right. right? The we momentum can, is gone. We can rest on our laurels. This is where I think business usually does much better than politics. I think I've talked to you about this. Where like at a business, when you're doing your job, it's not just like, okay, I've done 20% of the job and now I can wait a little bit and then I can do another 20%. Right? We, we kind of need the government, Congress to be acting more like a business in this case. So as voters, we kind of need to act like a bad boss, like a hard boss, like a hard ass boss, right? <laughs> who's who's kicking Congress's ass into doing something about this, despite the fact that they've already done something. Because yes, they've done something, but they haven't done enough yet. And there's more work to be done. Exactly. And this is what can come in a second Biden administration. In a second Biden administration, if the Democrats hold the House and the Democrats, I'm sorry, if the Democrats take the House and the Democrats hold the Senate and we have a second Biden administration, we can see some actual fundamental changes. Yeah. Truly. I mean, we, 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 will, have, we will have gotten rid of a lot of the moderates in the Democratic Party and the Senate. Mm. We can really unleash... Um, a climate program, maybe cap and trade, maybe carbon tax. Might be too late for those two things, but something like it could come and it would be really amazing. I don't think it's too late for those two things. Good. Yeah, I think those could definitely happen and be a huge help. Awesome. Yeah. Deep dive? Deep dive time, people. Nice. Okay. It is time. So we're talking about worker democracy today, which I don't know if you want to give the idea of, I feel like you might be a little bit more eloquent Sure. So on this. yeah, I'll talk about worker democracy from this standpoint here and kind of just talk about where it comes from and just the brief types that exist in our current economy. But first, it's a very simple definition, right? Workers having control over their workplaces, at least in some respect. 
it is really about bringing the Republican values that we've already brought to our government into the workplace. So we have escaped the authoritarianism in our government. We have taken off the shackles of kings, but we have not done so in our economic sector. We live in a democracy, but when we go to work, we're in a tyranny. And how do we change that, right? Managers and owners make all the decisions and workers aren't involved in those decisions that these enterprises make. What does that mean? It means the decisions that enterprises are making are in the interest of the managers and the owners, and they are not in the interest of the workers because the workers don't have a seat at that table. Mm -hmm. Now, in our current model, right, investors build out the hierarchy of an enterprise. Investors give money into the corporation, they buy shares, they buy ownership stake, they then elect corporate boards, corporate boards then appoint the managers, and then the managers control all of the workers. Well, in a worker in a worker controlled enterprise or a worker or an enterprise that um, embraces some form of worker democracy, the workers are putting their influence inside of that corporate board, which is then dictating how the company is being run. And it's almost like they're running themselves in a way. The same way you can picture a democratic or constitutional republic, that is where this goes. So there are three types of worker owners, worker owned enterprises that we're going to really be talking about. Um, Worker cooperatives, which is very, very straightforward of one member, one vote principle of workers owning the enterprise together and share the profits in some level, control though may differ. Then there is um, businesses who give their workers shares in a company. And then these, comp and then these uh, workers can then vote with these shares that the company gives them. And then the last is co-determinism, which is very, very popular throughout parts of Europe. Um, is there anything you want to add from there? Well, I'll, uh, yes, two things. So the, I'll just give some terminology to the type of business where there is, there are programs for the workers to own shares. Usually there's a trust that manages the share ownership and the employees pay into the trust and then they own some of the shares of the company. These are called, these are generally called companies with employee stock ownership programs. And so they're called ESOPs. And I just want to put that out there so we can use that moving on. Very good. These, Very and I want to define what co-determination, oh, yeah, co-determination I skipped over are. that one. Yeah. Yeah. So basically we're, Anthony mentioned how in a lot of the traditional companies we talk about or we think about, we have corporate boards that are elected by the shareholders and the owners that oversee everything in co-determined companies there are a certain number of the board seats that oversee everything that are allocated to positions for workers and for people who are elected by the workers. Yes. So there's some level of the oversight of the management that workers are necessarily involved in. Yeah. And I, I want to kind of talk about why we can start with the benefits of worker democracy generally, but I, this actually applies very specifically to the rise of co-determinism. So, um, Friedrich Hayek, who was a neoliberal, who was not somebody who would be for co-determinism or worker ownership in the sense that we're talking about here today, but he gives a really interesting um, economic problem that he thinks that centralized authorities, specifically governments, can't solve for. He's a large critic of centralized authorities trying to coordinate all these different economic units because these centralized authorities cannot regularly observe what is going on on the ground. So they can't determine what is best for each individual consumer or economic actor. Um, this is one of his largest critiques of Soviet communism, of Sovietism. Um, and he suggests that markets are simply the only way to coordinate these large scale sim systems because no one can master all of the information of all of the di all of these different um, economic units. This is also called the socialist calculation problem. Well, James Scott, who was an anarchist, uh, took Friedrich Hayek's um, analysis of the issues with centralized authority and then brought that same those same premises to a different conclusion. He takes that exact same framework and then he throws it back in the corporation's face. He says these top-down organizations in general, not just governmental organizations, they these corporations fail to understand the realities of economic life. And because the rule makers so often don't see the effects of the rules they implement, uh shareholders are actually a poor 
um, controller of corporate boards and corporate governance structures where workers who live the day-to-day -day life, who see it firsthand, really do have a larger benefit and a larger um, ability to give actually good input into how to run the company itself. It's kind of solving for that socialist calculation problem. Yeah, so I have two ideas on this. Um, one is that in a paper that I read, the anecdotes largely support that idea where the benefit of having an employee represented board seat or board seats is that there's better communication and understanding on both sides of each other. The employees get more insight into the ideas and strategies and um, goals of the shareholders and vice versa. The shareholders can more understand what's going on within the company because of the workers. On the other hand, I would I would wonder or I would argue wh about whether the shareholders really care about they I think they care about the information about what's going on in their company, mm -hmm. but they don't really care about the perspective of what's good for the workers. Right. No, they have no interest. Exactly. And because they have no interest, it's why it's important to get them on corporate boards because so sure. they can at least rally for their own interest. Yes. Now I want to stick on co-determinism for a second, and then maybe we could run down um, co-ops. And the and just share ESOPs. And ESOPs, yeah, yeah. So let's talk about co-determinism. I want to talk about this study that was done in Germany, and they were trying to see if firms that practiced co-determinism and firms that didn't practice co-determinism had different results with competitiveness and profitability. Well, they found that there was no difference with competitiveness or profitability. Um, and the way that they found this was they a German law was passed in 1994 that did not require new companies of a specific size that were smaller to practice this type of worker representation. Mm -hmm. So by comparing older firms who of the same size and newer firms of the same size, it was not clear... It, I'm sorry, it was not clear that these corporate, that workers on the corporate boards affected any type of competitiveness or, profit of, or profitability with the company. It also showed, though, that it did not show any increase in workers' wages, yeah. which is important to recognize. Co-determinism does not specifically increase workers' wages. That's what we've seen so far in the literature. The same thing was also found in Finland. Yes, the literature has shown that in multiple cases. Some analysis of that literature that I've seen is because every case of legally ordained co-determinism, which basically means these companies have to have a certain number of their seats elected by their workers, um, they never give the workers the majority power. I love the way you're going with that. That's exactly the right. They really, yes. the workers operate more as a supervisor to what the shareholders are deciding yeah. rather than an active partner in shaping deep company um, uh, 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 policy and investment strategies. Okay, I I wouldn't go that far. Okay, that's that's not what I read. At okay, least. where I'm where I'm trying to go is more like the the worker elected representatives are in these boardrooms and they are listening and they are participating in the conversations. So what I've read about the situation on boards with co determination, where at, where maybe half, pr probably less, are representative represented by the workers is that they are involved in discussions and more often than not, the boards are coming to consensus decisions. The problem is there is always, they're coming to those decisions with the context in the back of everyone's mind that the shareholder representative board members can always outvote the yeah. worker representative vote um, board members. So it is nice because they do have input into the discussions, right? But whether it's because they know that they have that disadvantage in the vote or whether they know that what's good for the company overall is sometimes generally good for, the is good for the workers. Right. Generally is good for the workers. I have read anecdotes of people in like this is like a magazine article talking about co-determinism. And, and there were some anecdotes of people suggesting like I feel like he was a worker representative on a corporate board. And he basically said he's like, I feel like I'm just watching. He's yes. like, I might as well be a camera. Yeah. Like, that's how he felt. He's like, I might as well be a camera. And then the workers could just go and watch what happened in the meetings. Right. I've, he, I've he, heard that too. Yeah. He felt like he wasn't making much of a difference. And it's good that you pointed out that this is because of the minority stake that workers have. And socialists in the 1910s and 1920s saw this fear. Social democratic parties in Germany in the 10s and 20s 
were actually against minority representation uh, on corporate boards. Because it's going to placate the workers. Because it was placating the workers and giving too much away to capital. Yeah. So they were specifically against this type of co-determinism, mm. which I find really interesting. Because now in the United States, we would fucking fucking eat this off the floor if this came to us as far as the progressives as far as the leftists yeah as far as the progressive side of the aisle would yeah um but that's yeah so co-determines co-determinationism is interesting i definitely think it's an interesting start to this type of thing well i i really want to ask do you think that a co-determination agreement where 60 percent of the board members were elected by workers would we have significantly different outcomes would we see real difference in companies that's what i'm so curious about i honestly don't know like i don't i don't think so i think companies would generally still be run in a similar way no no i i I can give you some examples about how a a major difference okay um so this is going to take us to our cooperative conversation sure sure but so if if we're going to start going to majority worker owned yeah now we're getting into co-ops yes so what is a worker cooperative i've said this before i'll say it again Worker cooperatives are like when workers collectively own the company. Now, there are some cooperatives that actually sell some of their shares to investors and shareholders, and then some allow them to elect some board members, some don't. So they could be non-voting shares, but mm-hmm. they still sell off ownership of their company. So I think a, co- a company that has majority worker ownership would operate more like a co-op sure. that is allowing shareholder investment, right? Mm-hmm. So in these companies, one of the big impacts we see is workers less likely to be fired okay. in times of recession and poor revenue. Because okay. when this happens, workers are more likely to take a pay cut than to be fired. I see. And they're more fluid with that because workers hold solidarity with one another. And in these cases, they say, okay, let's cut wages by 4% so that we can save everyone's jobs. Here's an example of this mm-hmm. in the United States that's not operating with worker ownership. UAW, during the recession, they decided to cut their pay and stop the um, cost of living uh, increase in wage adjustments specifically to keep everyone's jobs. I think that would be way more prominent in a majority owned worker company. Why do you think traditional companies don't go that route? I think it's, well, I think it's because it's faster to fire and cut that, cut out the waste. I think also think it's cheaper in the short term. Okay. It's, it's definitely cheaper in the short term. Yeah. Do you think it's because they need to serve up heads to oh. the shareholders. Oh, yeah, that's right. a great point. They need a bigger move for the audience to see. And I also think it's also psychological warfare against the workers that remain. Okay. I totally think it's like, a, you better play your cards right because we're not afraid to fire your ass. Yeah. Right? Yeah. You better be willing to do more for less. Otherwise. Yes, exactly. Yeah. Mm. Off you go. Okay. And there's also less inequality in firms that are cooperative. Okay. So there are way less... Um, inequality. Here's an example of the of uh, Uruguay. Uruguay has a massive cooperative. I say massive. It's two percent of the country, but it's it's a large relatively. Yeah, well, relatively. Yeah, it's a large cooperative sector, and these guys have a massive difference in compensation between CEOs and the lowest worker. Okay. So in the United States, so here Mondragon, the most famous corporate, most famous co-op that we'll talk about in strict detail in a second here. Um, has a CEO to worker ratio pay of about 20 to 1. Mm. The rest of Spain is 143 to 1. So there's a okay. lot less inequality in between the firm. That makes sense. And that's something that I think would happen in a majority owned or majority elected okay. company. I'm I'm, I'm less sure. Just because of how... I, I, think, I think this is where corporate structure comes into play. Mm-hmm. And having a... Even though you have a worker elected board, having a board that is still relatively disconnected from what is below, mm-hmm. right? And still having a a similarly hierarchical management structure of the company. Yeah. Boards don't do that much day to day. Boards don't, especially the bigger the company gets, obviously, but boards don't make the hiring, firing decisions mm-hmm. that much of the time. No, I so agree. I think for co-determination i i think you do need something that is more like employee ownership at a large scale Mm -hmm. to get both more equivalent incomes and less strict firing so what you're saying is majority elected worker cooperatives 
doesn't go far enough in the worker cooperative direction to see the benefits of a worker cooperative in terms of reducing pay between CEO. Yeah, to see the okay. hopeful benefits. Okay. Right. Yes, I yes. understand. You need you need worker ownership more than worker representation on a board. I totally agree. Yeah, I totally agree. Yeah. Um, and worker ownership solves both problems. Yes. Right. Yes. And this is actually a great transition into ESOPs. Yes. So. Uh, do you want to give the explanation of an ESOP? Yeah. So an ESOP, uh, we we mentioned this at the beginning, but an ESOP is an employee stock ownership program. Uh, I think the best example that you could think of in the U.S. for anyone watching this is Publix, which is a grocery store that operates mostly in the Southeast. Um, basically, there's a trust that owns most, if not all, of the stock of a company. And the, the trust is paid into by the employees uh, so that it can distribute shares to the employees. So the employees are still the ones that own the shares of the company, but it's not like a co-op because it's not it's not necessarily one share one vote. It's not that all of the employees own equal amounts of shares. It's completely it's variable based on how long an employee has been on a company, how much they've wanted to pay into the trust. Um, but it does give them, I think, this is where I'm unclear and I should have done more research some amount of voting power it does okay it does most ESOPs will I can't tell you about Publix but most okay. ESOPs will yeah now what's also important to talk about is these trusts that are operated on behalf of the workers mostly most of the time or at least some of the time don't have sell-off opportunities mm. once you put the money into the trust you're taking ownership into the company and it's not like these shares can just be foregoed by the workers and they could all sell off unless you like quit or something like yes. that. yes so these ESOPs I think are a very, very viable path to the United States getting some type of worker ownership in the economy. Yeah. Because we already have a lot of share buyback, not share buyback, that's not the right word, um, share uh, uh, stock options programs in the United States. Yes. I have stock options with my company. I don't know the exact way that I'm able to vote on everything, but I do know that I'm able to take partial ownership of my company through stock buy, through uh, stock options. And that is a way that United States could very, very easily transition mm -hmm. into a type of worker democratic framework. Yes. And now it gets easier for places that are already heavily unionized to go the more public's route of like make, setting up a specific trust that's run on behalf of the workers. Yeah. And that takes up more time, uh, takes up more and more capital over time. Um, but there is one issue with cooperatives that I think is really important to mention. With cooperatives or with ESOPs? Sorry. Or this, with both? Sorry, sorry. I think this... No, no, This is specifically with cooperatives. But what, okay. what more do you have to say about ESOPs? Well, the... Oh, I was, I was going to say something. Yeah, like the United States and Japan, ESOPs is the way to do it. Oh, all I was going to say is that ESOPs have been on the rise in the U.S. The, honestly, the main... Because there, there have been a lot of studies that have come out over the past couple of decades that have shown their benefits, that has shown it's... It means you're going to have better worker retention. Um, Way your better workers worker are going retention. to be more productive. Uh, you're going to have a better culture where everyone is way more invested in doing something for the company, which obviously makes sense. Um, so ESOPs are on the rise. Awareness remains the biggest barrier. Right. Awareness is the biggest barrier. Yes. Um, and that's something that we're trying to combat. Yeah. Right. That's one of the points. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. That's why we want to talk about it. It's, it's interesting. So... I, really quickly, as we're about to make the transition from ESOPs to co-ops, mm -hmm. one thing I would bring up is how these happen. How are one of these made? Because mm. that's the main thing I was thinking about sure. with worker democracy, right? When I, I was, I read one paper that's about that kind of is is discussing the ideas, the theory behind why you would separate the decision making power from the decision kind of evaluation power whereas like the shareholders are the decision evaluators and a ceo or the the managers of the company are the decision makers right um and part of the idea was oh wait did i just completely lose my train of thought i might have just completely lost my train of thought oh no way um why are there why is it managerial and overseeing roles separated yeah no but I, I i was trying to come from somewhere else um god damn it uh okay oh would, no way no but between esops and okay no how how these are made how, these oh, are how made. they're made yes so so i was starting with with esops it it makes more sense with how esops are made to me because you need a profit motive to first 
um, establish a company. I, I just went too, I just realized I went too far with my train of yeah, thought. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. And I couldn't connect it back. <laughs> you went way too far. Uh, yeah. But I, but I, so you need to think, why does someone start a company? Well, because there's massive upside because you get your share of all of the profits of that company, right? And you get to choose how much you're going to allocate those gains, and whether you're going to allocate those gains based on ownership of the company, and you're probably going to choose not to do so because then you get to do, you have more upside, mm -hmm, right? Because mm -hmm. more of the profits belong to you. So when I was thinking about how co-ops are made, I'm like, this has to be really hard because the other, the risk that the person who starts the business takes on is also enormous, yeah. right? Because you could just not be rewarded by the market, mm -hmm. right? So it makes very, it seems to make very little sense to start a co-op up from nothing because you just get so little of the potential rewards. Well, this brings up a really good point about co-ops, but I want to go right off of that. Well, I'm going okay. to start with ESOPs okay. and why with ESOPs, you don't have that problem as much because it's just like going to market with the company. It's like right. an IPO, except you just sell to the employees. Right. So that's a way that an oh, ESOPs yeah. are easier to get into. With co-ops, it's still a big problem. And a lot of times co-ops form by just being a bunch of disparate organizations that realize that by joining together and sharing ownership of a bigger organization, they might have better bargaining power as a buyer or as a seller. Yeah. Yeah. And another, so then this brings into one, how do co-ops get formed? Well, I can go through a list. So co-ops, I've given you the definition, worker owned, kind of one person, one vote. Mm -hmm. There are a bunch of different things, but it's really like really the purest form of worker ownership. The purest form. The purest form. Yes. Okay. A lot of studies studying small scale worker, worker co-ops and small scale, you know, regular traditional businesses kind of fall flat because there's a massive amount of selection bias. You have to be very ideological to the commit to to the to the goal of forming cooperatives yeah. to join one. Yeah. You're going to be way more likely to take reduced pay to keep your company alive, right? So that survivorship bias of cooperatives, especially on that small scale, is a real problem on how we study their effectiveness on that smaller scale. Totally. And that and then that brings into the perfect thing that you were talking about: difference of starting an ESOP and a co-op. If you're going in and you're starting a co-op, you are ideologically committed to that project in a lot of ways it takes a lot mm -hmm. now in in france and italy and uruguay these com these countries actually do a lot to incentivize the creation of co-ops so, uh, northern italy has a massive cooperative sector and this goes back to the socialist roots of northern italy um so these co-ops um are exempted from a lot of corporate taxation mm. they're exempted from a lot of them and one of the things that makes them so interesting that makes it easy to start a co-op in northern Spain is if your company goes under that you're working for, instead of all the people in that company taking their unemployment benefits and, you know, living off of it, all the different employees can use their unemployment benefits to reinvest into the company and buy it outright. Interesting. So if a company were to go under in the traditional sense, mm -hmm. the, the the employees can say, nope, it's not going under. We're taking our unemployment insurance. We're putting it back into the company. And we're running it ourselves. Wow. Which is a really great policy. That's cool. Yeah, that's really cool. Yeah. And again, but, but that's survivorship bias because now we're talking about a lot of people who have such intense loyalty that it's going to be very hard to compare the success of that company to a regular traditional enterprise. Sure. But maybe that's also a part of the point is these people are so loyal to their company that it's one of the benefits. So it's very hard to, to study this topic. To that out. Yeah. Yeah. It's very, very hard. But Definitely. also in France, I want to talk about this. Um, there is a really great um, – there. there is a lot of regulation around the French economy that tries to keep co-ops from devouring themselves. Now, I haven't seen evidence that co-ops do devour themselves. I've seen them be very effective – um, large scale, small scale, they don't seem to do that. But the French uh, tax policy says that a certain percent of the profits of any worker run enterprise needs to go directly back into the business. Mm. And they're trying to get as they're trying to keep co-ops alive as much as possible, because these states have a bit of a, a ideological commitment to creating them. Yeah, which I think the United States could do. And we actually do have a little bit of tax advantages for uh, co-ops in the United States. They're just not utilized. Yeah. We actually have them. They do exist. Well, because again, the, it's going to take a choice. Right. For someone at some point to give up all of that consolidated power. Yes. Right. And that's hard, especially in 
our culture. Yes. Which is so much like, let me win. Right. Let me win. We talk about like, we, we think about, I think that we think about the, that was too many I think. <laughs> We think of the businessman as the next frontiersman of the cowboy yeah, in our culture. Totally. Right? But it's really so much different from a cowboy because a cowboy was alone on the ranch. Um, a businessman is not. He is relying on the people around him just as much as he's relying on himself, whether he knows it or not. Yeah. Everyone he hires is intricate to the production. Yeah. So, Well, I think something implicit and not spoken about or paid attention to in the story of the businessman is that... He had like, weirdly, it's like he has figured out and maneuvered his way to be able to use the labor of all of these people Mm -hmm. to boost himself to this point. Yes. To this peak. Yes. Right. And so like that's that's something we're not willing to accept as a culture. I think. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. And I and I hear conservatives or, or economic conservatives talk about how like, oh, one million or three million people in America last year made a million dollars. You don't think everyone could do that? Everyone could do that if they worked hard enough. No, no, no. No, they couldn't because the only reason that three million could is because 250 million didn't. Yes. Because 250 million boosted them up and allowed them to take more of the money, allowed them to pay the workers less than they created in yes. money. They are extracting the surplus value from their workers in order to get that high yes. of an income. Which again, I'm not I'm not completely against because I think we do need to pay lip service. Right. There are some benefits. societal benefits. There well, are. Well, not only societal benefits, like they take on more risk. Mm-hmm. Right? They they make the gamble. They're willing to go out there and and put and do the hard thing of starting the business of having all the ideas and of me making themselves kind of the person who the buck stops with yeah at every step of the way yes that is not easy no but i do think but then this is when esops come in when it reaches that certain point of growth Mm. it no longer is that much risk on that person true and so at that point it needs to start shifting into a larger collective enterprise organization mm. that is operating for the benefit of all because that that first risk, you've been rewarded. It is now much larger than you and has surpassed anything you could have done on your own or even your brainchild creation in your notebook. I kind of like that idea. So some kind of legislation may be saying companies above X number – they become ESA. I love that you're saying this right now because I have Bernie Sanders' policy proposal from the 2020 presidential election, and it's, it's that. Really? Well, I'm going to read it to you outright. Please. It's really good, but I will when we're done. That, that's what Are I want to end Are we not done? With. I feel like we were getting to no, no, a great no. point. The last, thing, the last thing I want to end with. Mondragon? Ma- Mondragon. Mondragon. Okay. Mondragon. Because these are the downsides of a worker cooperative, and I want to be honest with them. Mm. So the firm has grown massively. It was literally five guys in the Basque region of Spain. It is now 10,000. Um, I think it I actually, I think it's 10,000 workers or something across mm. the globe. Wow. And so each one of these cooperatives elect representatives, which then go to an international Mondragon Congress to elect the president. This is causing a lot of problems because now people feel like their voices aren't actually getting heard. And in addition to this, Mondragon has taken on hiring contractors instead of bringing on people as full employee owners mm. because they don't want to expand the employee ownership anymore, which is lame as hell. Yeah. And so when the 2008 recession hit, they just fired all their contractors, uh, which Damn. is like defeating the purpose of a worker cooperative. Uh. So there is a lot of room to grow in this space, but this is just one of the most prominent examples. Now, Let's end with where the United States can go. Yeah. I think we've said that the ESOPs are the best way of the United States to do this. Some type of co-determinationism plus ESOP program is the best way to get this done. Mm-hmm. So I want to read to you some of the things that Bernie Sanders was proposing in the 2020 presidential campaign. Um, He wants to share corporate wealth with workers. Under his plan, corporations with at least $100 million in annual revenue or corporations with at least $100 million in balance sheet total and all publicly traded companies will be required to provide at least 2% of stock to their workers every year until the company is at least 20% owned by employees. This will be done through the issuing of new shares and the establishment of democratic 
employee ownership funds. These are the trust funds you were referring to. Mm -hmm. Next, the funds will enjoy the same voting rights as any other institutional shareholder, and their shares will not be permitted to be transferred or sold. Instead, they will be held permanently in a trust for the workforce. Dividend payments will be made from the funds directly to the employees. This is like a type of profit sharing. Then, 45% of the board of directors in any large corporation with at least $100 million in annual revenue, corporations with at least $100 million in balance sheets total, and all publicly traded companies would be directly elected by the firm's workers, similar to what happens under employee co-determination in Germany, which long has one of the most productive and successful economies in the world. That is incredible that a politician in the United States of America was pushing this type of transformative program on the national stage like this? I don't think it's enough. I love that you feel that way. Well, okay. So first of all, the, the, uh, I'm going to lay out all my thoughts here. I heard the 100 million number. I was like, is that too small? But then you think, okay, pretty much no $100 million company is public. Right. Right. So this is a private company which might have certain private investors i guess i'm, I'm wondering like how diluted could that 100 million get right could that 100 million get diluted enough that the people running the company that it's still small and still has a ton of room for growth in a way that would honestly help the economy and that you're legitimately removing incentive mm-hmm. for the ceo for the founders that got all this investment and that hired all these people by diluting it anymore right so that is one question another yeah, question. question the 20 percent number provide at least 2% of the stock to their workers every year until the company is at least 20% owned by employees. Seems too little to me. So I'm think, I think, I think I want one of these laws to give 51% to the employees. I want it to get to the point where employees can fully own the, the, the company. So worst case scenario is they don't like the CEO or the, the owner of the 49%, the founder, He's put on his ass to do nothing, and he's sitting with 49% of at least a $100 million company. In my opinion, probably should be more than a $100 million company. Yeah. Then, because they have that amount of power, the employees can decide to make it a full co-op, can decide to buy even more of the company from the person, so they can democratize these even further. But most importantly... But the shares, so that- but the shares stop getting issued at 51. Yes. Got yes, it. they can decide to do more of it themselves then because you have enough democratic control at that point. Mm-hmm. Um, and besides, I, I guess besides that, the 40, it, if you're the 45 going to, is just connected to what I'm already right. saying. If you're saying 51% ownership, the 45 number now becomes irrelevant. Exactly. Wow. Great stuff, man. Yeah. I, if we're, if we're going to do this, let's, let's, let's push, fucking do it. Let's push the Overton window yes. so that we have a real solution yes. in view. Hell yeah. So worker democracy, it's really awesome, has its ups and downs, but it will be the future. We'll make sure of it. Thank you. See you guys.